morning good evening to everyone all around the world uh on behalf of pediatric section of urology society of india and indian school of urology it is my honor to welcome you all to this esteemed global pediatric webinar as president of urology society of india i am truly delighted to see such a diverse and distinguished gathering of pediatric urology from all over the world coming together to share knowledge insight and innovation in pediatric urology our collective commitment to improving the health and well-being of our youngest patient is both noble and inspiring as we navigate through the sessions and presentations lined up for today i encourage each of you to actively participate engage in meaningful discussion and leverage this invaluable opportunity to expand your understanding and expertise in pediatric urology together let us strive to push the boundaries of knowledge innovation and our shared goal of delivering the highest standard of care to every child all over the world in need i extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the speakers organizers and participants for their dedication and contribution to this webinar your passion and commitment are driving force behind our collective efforts to shape the future of pediatric urology i wish you all a very productive and encouraging experience during this webinar and may we continue to work together towards a brighter and healthier future for the children all over the world thank you thank you very much thank you very much uh, uh, dr lalit the uh, usa president and now uh, dr uttam mete who is uh, head of the uh, head of the urology department scpgi medical college uh, sorry pgi medical college i'm extremely sorry uh, for opening remarks uh, he is the secretary of urological society of india dr uttam good evening all uh, from india uh, mr president dr lalisa president of the pediatric sub section of uh, usi professor amil albhat and the whole council of pediatric urology sub section the chairman of uh, isu our principal dr sujata all the foreign faculty and national faculty and delegates as a secretary of our society it is my proud privilege to welcome you all to join this webinar today and it is actually truly a global webinar in true sense i have never seen such so many so many experts from all over the world on the same platform for this i really want to congratulate the subsection and a special thanks and special congratulation or or for dr anil takbani for arranging this global webinar and i'm sure this is going to be an enriching and collaborating learning experience for all the participants you know being in pgi what i see 90% of the pediatric urology cases are being performed by pediatric surgeons so that has led me to believe that most probably the pediatric urology is being snatched away from urologist of today but how to keep us keep this same subsection with us and there are several ways i'm not going to discuss that way but one of the way is what we are going to do today that is to organize such type of webinars which are really educative informative and all the experts from all over the world that should attract and that has attracted more than 600 participants it's a great job by this subsection i am really delighted to do that and another way to motivate the young urologists who are just passing out to practice pediatric urology is to know the contributions of the legends in this field and today most probably we are going to discuss the contribution of two legends one is from our own dr venugopal another is dr kenning i think with these things or this sort of deliberations will actually motivate and create interest among the young urologists who are passing out from indian uh, you know medical colleges or institutions as you all know that the, our agenda for this webinar includes some clinical updates in key issues like hypospadias fuse op posterior third valve etc some surgical innovations but i think the another uh, most important aspect of this webinar which we are missing is the global networking so because we will be in, in, interacting with so many Uh, you know experts all over the world this will give us as as platform to interact with them okay, that's why i invite all pediatric urologists to actively participate contribute to discussions and take advantage of this unique opportunity let us come together to advance the field of pediatric urology improve our patient outcomes ultimately whatever is we are going to discuss whatever is the advancement of the science it is going to be uh, you know uh, to the for the benefit of our patients and with these few words i once again i extend my gratitude to all the foreign faculty members of course our national faculty members for joining this webinar 
somebody is in the early in the morning somebody is in the evening somebody must be on the vacation but still they have joined it and that shows their passion for this subject and i want the participants should learn this and they should also develop some passion for this subject it's a really good subject thank you all thanks a lot thank you very much uh, dr uttam secretary urological society of india and now dr suchata patwadan a uh, very quick welcome address from you she is yes. our chairman of uh, indian school of urology dr suchata yeah, good evening everyone respected uh, presidents uh, president of the urology society of india and president of the pediatric section dr bhat and um, uh, dr uttam mete and dr ansari Uh, so i first need to uh, admit that uh, uh, entire if, uh, efforts of this webinar are dr anil takwani all alone and I, i thank him for involving us in collaboration in this webinar and uh, definitely look forward to having much more uh, detailed and um, more sumptuous discussions in pediatric urology my grateful thanks to all the participants who are participating from all the globe and to the students and i hope uh, everybody has a good learning thank you very much thank you ma'am uh, thank you very much for your uh, welcome address uh, uh, we have uh, 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 dedicated this webinar second webinar we dedicated to uh, professor syam joshi who passed away at that time and this is third webinar <laughs> we are dedicating this webinar to professor douglas canning and our own uh, professor venu gopal sir and uh, i request dr kesu murthy to speak about uh, professor venu gopal and his contribution uh, professor kesu murthy yeah, you can say speak. thank you for uh, taking this responsibility dr kesu am i visible and yes, am i heard yes sir go ahead please good evening everybody and good morning to my friends overseas let me thank the pediatric urology section for giving this opportunity to pay special tribute to this gentleman professor p venugopal p venugopal he had spoken about his journey of pediatric urology for over 50 years in 2018 and this slide is borrowed from his presentation he was fondly called as guruji by all of us in india and he will not require any introduction to the urologists in india because he was a very well known personality but for the overseas he was the one who drew the passion for pediatric urology in india along with professor sham joshi he was the son of an illustrious father professor ckp menon who was a very famous surgeon in those times and the urological society of india had recognized this and instituted a uh, professor ckp menon best paper prize for the residents which was the most sought after paper prize for the residents in the annual conference of the urological society of india these three people are the ones who influenced the career of professor p venugopal professor raghavachari professor p k r warrior he was the surgeon at trivandrum when uh, professor p venugopal was doing his masters in surgery at trivandrum and professor h s bart who was the head of the department of urology also called the father of urology in india was the one who influenced professor venugopal to join urology at cmc bello professor p venugopal was born on the valentines day that was the 14th february in 1940 and graduated from medical college pondicherry in 1961 he did his masters in general surgery from medical college and hospital trivandrum in 1966 and then joined cmc bello in 1968 to pursue mch urology He had a brief stint as a senior lecturer in CMC Bangalore from 68 to 70. After which he got a Commonwealth Fellowship in UK for training in pediatric urology under the guidance of Professor Swinney. He came back to India in 71 and joined KMC as reader in urology, and he started the Department of Urology there, which was a prestigious and a very well-known urology department of those times. he headed this department till june 1993 when he prematurely retired from the department he was a very active member of the urological society of india he was the youngest president of the urological society of india in and was president from 1982 to 84 he was the honorary treasurer of the indian journal of urology from 84 to 92 it was during his presidency that the indian journal of urology was started and he went on to become the chairman of the editorial committee of the indian journal of urology 
from 1992 to 2000. In fact, when he was alive, he was all praised to the Indian Journal of Urology, the way it has progressed from the time he instituted it. And we are proud that the Indian Journal of Urology is indexed on as an impact factor of 1.2. He had numerous awards and orations to his name, including the Himadri Saka oration in 1986, when he spoke about large ureters, which was a marvelous oration at that point of time. And he was also the recipient of the Urology Gold Medal and the Professor H.S. Bhatt oration in Esukon in 1997. Even at the age of 70, 75, he was, his passion for teaching was so immense that he had started this Euro education group in the Yahoo. I think Anil Takwani would know about it because he was pushing Anil Takwani hard to get this going. He would post interesting cases in pediatric urology in this Euro education group, and there was a lot of discussion about this. And this man at the age of 75, 78 was so good at the computers that you ask him any literature, he would in a day or two get you all the literature and we have gone to him with so many requests. He has never said no for any of those requests and he continued to do that till he was alive. His passion for teaching was so much. This was a slide again taken from his when he uh, gave his oration of 50 years of pediatric urology. He was paying tribute to Professor John Sweeney, who was the coordinator of his pediatric urology training, at, and also J. A. Scott at the Fleming Memorial Hospital. He also had brief stints at the Great Ormond Street and Earl Hess Hospital at Liverpool. I cannot miss this gentleman also, Dr. Sham Joshi, another pediatric urologist who was very passionate about the development of pediatric urology in India. When both of them were together in any of the conferences or any of the meetings, it was only pediatric urology which was discussed and they were always thinking of how to develop this subspeciality. And I must uh, confess that it was the push of Sham Joshi and pediatric and uh, Professor P. Venugopal that the USI recognized this and developed this as a subspeciality with the efforts of people like Amila Albat, Ansari and Takwani. Now pediatric urology is a subspeciality in India. Professor Nalini Venugopal was the woman behind the success of Professor P. Venugopal. She was an accomplished pathologist and they had two children, Arvind and Anand. They lost Arvind in a road traffic accident, but Anand Venugopal is now the chief of the radiology at the KMC Manipal and also the CEO of the academics of the Mahe. And these are some of the photographs. This is the at the inauguration of the urology floor at Manipal. And this was the annual conference at Manipal where Venugopal uh, conducted this in 1982 and it's famously called as the Manipal Conference. He was his teaching, he was the Professor Emeritus at KMC Manipal till his last. He was always involved in teaching and he was the um, uh, man behind uh, Pro Dr. Lakshman Prabhu. Unfortunately, we lost Lakshman Prabhu last year in November who followed his guru in a few months after the expiry of Professor Venugopal. And this was the last felicitation which I remember. He attended the workshop in Mysore where he was felicitated. And we don't, we miss his physical presence, but I am sure the pediatric urology in India and will remember it for a long time and his legacy will continue. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Kaisumuthi. Stop sharing your screen and uh... Very, you know, absolutely very emotional time and words. Uh, I received his last uh, message on 5th of April, a couple of months before he became very sick. And that was an excellent paper, which was published by the Christopher Woodhouse on the long-term outcome with the posterior thoval patients, uh, even after the fetal intervention. We are going to have uh, some talk from the UK only, but this is what the, he was that he was constantly pushing your students uh, uh, to the level wherever it is as high as possible. So with that, uh, if Dr. Anand is there, Dr. Anand? Yeah, hi. Yeah. Would you like to say a couple of yeah, words? Well, yeah, first of all, thanks to uh, Urology Society of India and uh, in specific the Pediatric Urology section. Thanks for this honor to my dad. Uh, it's quite emotional, actually, but uh, I'm sure yeah, he would have had a... Yeah, I'm sure he would have enjoyed this uh, kind of thing. 
and uh, since i've been in nadiyat for quite some time so i thank all of you for taking this uh, initiative and uh, keeping his memory alive thanks a lot and dr uh, anand thank you very much for joining us and having this emotional words uh, uh, really very very emotional moment for us because uh, he would have not missed a single minute of this webinar uh, or any of the webinar whenever it is possible by him so with that uh, we are uh, uh, extending our tribute to dr douglas canning and i request dr asim sukla joined from the children hospital philadelphia to say some two words about dr douglas canning asim yes uh, can you hear me okay yes yes perfect Thank you, uh, Dr. Takwani. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lalit Shah, Dr. Mete, Dr. Patwardhan, and all of the uh, leaders uh, and friends that I see on the screen in front of me. It's really, truly a pleasure to join all of you uh, and to share just a few words about Doug. Uh, I mean, I think uh, all of you uh, here, we've had other opportunities, uh, fortunately, uh, to <coughs> share some memories of Doug Canning. And uh, you know, it's been uh, nearly two years uh, since we lost, lost Doug so suddenly. And the world really lost uh, Doug Canning and the imprint uh, that he had made on all of us. As I was, as I was thinking uh, about his love for India, all of you know he had made uh, uh, more than five trips to uh, Ahmedabad uh, for the Extrophy Workshop and deeply was committed to improving uh, and contributing to the growth and development of pediatric urology in India, I had spoken at the USICON on, on multiple occasions uh, and was really a friend of the USI, as all of you know. As I thought of him and knowing that Dr. Takwani had kept uh, uh, Doug's memory alive so well uh, in India, and uh, Anil Bai is from uh, Junagadh, so I thought, I thought of the poet, uh, you know, from uh, Junagadh, uh, and uh, Narsi Mehta. And I thought of his words because they perfectly encapsulate Doug Canning. Vaishnava jana to tene kahiye je peed padai jane re para dukhe upakar kare toye mana abhi manana aane re. A good, uh, a ideal human being, one like Doug Canning, is one who feels the pain of others, one who helps those in misery, and does not take let pride ever cloud his mind. Sakala loka ma saune vande ninda na kare ke ni re vacha kacha mana nischala rakhe. And samadrashti ne trishna tyagi jiva thaki asatya na bole. So, you know, the translation for that is that an ideal human being. Uh, is one that tolerates and pr it always praises others, never himself. Uh, one who would never, ever say a bad or negative thing about anyone else, and one whose tongue would never speak the untruth. And all of us who know Doug know his legacy, that that's exactly what it encapsulated. That, you know, to know Doug was to really feel for others, the empathy that he showered, because you knew it was genuine. It came from his heart when you sat with Doug, when he met you for the first time, you knew that he truly cared. Um, and he really cared about India. He cared about what he saw, about the access issues, about some of the socioeconomic difficulties and the patients at a government hospital uh, that he saw. Um, and, you know, what I, as his student, uh, for me, he was, of course, my guru. He trained me. I came to CHOP here 22 years ago. Uh, and he brought me back here as a faculty. And it was really truth. You know, he would never, ever, uh, and it was truth in reporting, truth in reporting outcomes. Let's talk about our real hypospadias outcomes. Let's, let's really talk about bladder extrophy. And let's put it out there. And that will allow others also to take that example and speak truth. So for Doug, the way he has shaped our specialty what he has meant uh, to, uh, to me personally, but I hope all of you that have been touched by him in some way, uh, by, the, uh, by the work that he has done, the contributions that he has made, and the human being that he was, uh, I, I, I appreciate this opportunity and I'm really grateful. And I'm sure if Annabelle is here, she would be so thrilled uh, that this webinar is being shared with his memory and Dr. Venugopal's memory. The two of them had met at Yusakan before, uh, and I think it's such a poignant tribute uh, 
uh, to truly a great man. So I wish you a, a wonderful event today. I'm sorry that my schedule was already booked with some surgery since I spent so much time in India. Uh, and I, I feel that I'm probably overexposed with all the talks I gave at Yusikan and, and in Ahmedabad. Uh, but I will be in and out and, and watching. And, uh, and I know Doug is uh, smiling uh, from above, uh, looking at the, the growth and the development of pediatric urology in India. Thank you. Thank you, Asim. Thank you very much for these excellent words. Uh, and we will never, ever forget the ever-smiling face of the glass scanning. It's very, it's not possible. So he's in our heart. And uh, uh, Annabella, I request you to say a few words. Yes. Um, good morning um, and good evening, um, everyone. Thank you, Anil, for asking me to speak for a few minutes. And thank you, Asim, for your wonderful thoughts about Doug. Um, thanks also to all of you for honoring my husband, Doug Canning, as part of this global webinar. My children and I miss him deeply, but are blessed with many wonderful memories, as well as wonderful friends and colleagues from the life we shared together for over 40 years. Um, Doug always felt blessed to be able to care for children with complex um, pediatric urologic disorders, to work with so many wonderful people, includes, including so many of you, on the, this Zoom today and to make a difference in the lives of families. Doug believed deeply in collaboration, educating the next generation of pediatric urologists and sharing the results of research and surgical techniques. My children and I decided when we lost Doug so early in his life that we would raise funds that would enable CHOP urology, um, including uh, with, I think really a seam leading much of this um, to continue Doug's vision and legacy of working with others to advance the care of children, both in the US and abroad, particularly in India. Um, we have been raising money to fund this ongoing global collaboration to advance the treatment of children with complex disorders, such as bladder extrophy. Finally, um, we are all very honored that Doug would be remembered as part of this webinar. Um, thank you for inviting me to participate as you continue to work on behalf of the children. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, quickly, Sardar, you wanted to say something to Annabelle? <clears throat> Hi, Annabelle. It's a pleasure to see you here again. <laughs> Wonderful uh, to see you. Doc has been a great friend to all of us. His, his legacy will live forever. <laughs> and he was a true example of honesty, sincerity, innovation, collaboration, and we will remember him forever. And we'd like to see you all the time with us in, every, in many meetings. Uh, thanks for being with us. You always reminds us of him. <laughs> Greetings to everyone at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sardar. Thank you very much, uh, Annabelle. And thank you all uh, for uh, joining in this first uh, uh, part of the uh, webinar. And now we are uh, moving to the serious business. Uh, that is the uh, Amir Albert, uh, chairman of the pediatric urology section. You will be giving welcome address for a minute and then you will continue with this presentation on spongioplasty in hypospadia surgery. So Professor Amir Albert, our uh, champion of uh, hypospadia surgery, hypospadiologist and uh, champion the spongioplasty which we, started, we all started believing it. So go ahead, sir. And President of Urological Society of India, Secretary and uh, Chair ISU, and all the dignitaries, global dignitaries. It's my pleasure to welcome you all in this uh, third global pediatric urology webinar. And what we say, unfortunately, all three had been in the memory of, of some uh, our stalwarts, and it's a, a good, a real tribute. And I think this is a real tribute that in this uh, webinar we have uh, collected in a large number, about more than 700 registrations we have this. And this gives me a pleasure also that the youngsters in India also they are interested in uh, the pediatric urology. And I can assure the youngest that this is the best field for practicing medicine. This includes in today's pediatric urology, endourology, 
uptake of uh, renal transplant, pediatric urology, reconstructive urology, minimal SS surgery and everything. So future of the Indian children as well as the pediatric urology section in USA is a very bright. And I thank all the participants and the foreign dignitaries to making it in a, such a gathering. Thank you very much. With these few words, now I shift over to Thank my you, sir. Thank you. Talk. Yeah, you can share your screen. Thank you very much for your uh, welcome uh, address, sir. Uh, Please mute others. Uh, I'm requesting uh, others to mute uh, their microphone uh, so it doesn't disturb the professor Milal Pat. Yeah, please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Anil, you for making quiet. the part quiet, of this quiet, one. And quiet, I have nothing to disclose. And I'll be uh, discussing the existence of spongiosum, its classification, how and why the spongioplasty should be Then our modifications with can it be done in the clap repair and the redo cases. Basically, many. Many, many times when I give talk, people ask that the, uh, in a hyperspedias cases, spongiosum is absent. No, it is never absent because it is a part of the uh, glance is the part of the ex extension of the spongiosum. So if glance is present, that means embryologically spongiosum is there that lies under the urethral plate over the deep layer of box fascia and enlarges to make the glance literally. Identification also, I see in many, many of my talks that people say that we are not able to identify. You see, everything lies on the shaft and penis. You just have to look for it. You see, in all these cases, you can see these spongiosal pillar. Even after penile degloving, you can see and you can see the bifurcation of the spongiosum. First time we... Uh, <clears throat> classified the spongiosum into poorly, moderately, and well-developed in 2014. And later on, Jang et al. in 2020, they also divided in well and poorly developed. But the flaw in their, their, their classification was they used the terminology of fibrosis. Let me make it clear that there is no fibrous tissue causing cardi in hypospedias. This is hypoplastic spongiosum. We divided this is poorly developed with poor blood supply, thin, and tubularization of this makes this one to the diameter of the neo-urethra is less than the proximal healthy urethra. It is almost in the uh, moderately developed and is well developed. It is a good spongiosum, robust with good vascularity and diameter of the spongiosum is more than the proximal healthy urethra. So the disadvantage in this classification is that this is totally subjective one, and it is difficult to differentiate between the moderate and the well-developed spongiosum. Another important point, why should we do spongioplasty? The basic principle in the any of the congenital anomaly is to reconstruct normal or the near normal anatomy with the existing tissue or the supplementation of the tissue. An ideal replacement of the urethra is only the urethra. And TIP urethroplasty with spongioplasty reconstructs a near normal urethra. You can see this one. This is with the spongiosum. So spongioplasty is a locally healthy available tissue, maintains the blood supply of the urethral plate, reconstruct a near normal urethra, and Y2I spongioplasty adds length to the sponge, spongiosum to cover the curvature and assess any other additional tissue like tunica vaginalis, dartos, or any other tissue for supporting this can be used along with this one. Yerkes and dodet use this one. Dotted used this spongioplasty by mobilizing the spongiosal pillar from both sides and then approximating in the midline. The disadvantage with this technique is that the spongiosal segment has been incised from both sides and then are brought in the midline. So the 
that covers the there is not full coverage at the site of the new uh, uh, original meatus and there is partial coverage or at the bifurcation so these are the uh, factors which leads to fistula so we modified these technical modifications what was the mobilization mobilization was proximal to distal and medial lateral to medial one so that mobilizes the urethra completely and with the tension free anastomosis another point is this mobilization has to be continued into the glans so when you do in into the glans then the site of the second site common site of fistula is subcoronal area and this is being covered by the spongiosum another important points in technical modification is that tubularization we start about a centimeter proximal to proximal to the neo uh, original meatus so that it covers nicely the meatal site and then spongioplasty about a centimeter proximal to it and spongioplasty is extended to the neo meatus this you can see a small video tubularization has been done now we are doing the spongioplasty with continuous suture 70 and this is a very good healthy cover over the tubularized urethral plate even if you are using the interrupted suture still you can do the spongioplasty in a very nice way you see just after doing the tubularization you can see this healthy spongiosal pillar are being raised spongioplasty is started proximal to the tubularization and this is the coronal area where we are taking such a good healthy tissue to cover the coronal area with spongiosum so there are hardly any chance leaving any chance to fistula formation we published our results none of the patient with the well developed spongioplasty had had any fistula there is superimposition in this the simple spongioplasty so we did this double breasting here we can have this one flap sutured over this one and then spongioplasty covers this one so we published our results and are almost less than 2% of fistula then it can be done at the anastomotic side preserve the spongiosum and urethral plate and then you cover with this with the anastomosis so that prevents the fistula and the suture at the site of anastomosis and even in redo cases you can go ahead and do the spongioplasty and these are the results and if we review the literature that with the spongioplasty the fistula rate is less than 6% and so in conclusion spongioplasty urethroplasty with spongioplasty reconstructs a normal urethra double breasting prevents the superimposition of the suture line so prevent fistula then spongioplasty can be done flap and the redo cases so we recommend spongioplasty in all cases of the hypospedia as repair as far as possible thank you very much so i thank request you. i yeah, take this opportunity to uh, invite you to join this pediatric urology conference in 3rd and 4th july thank you very much thank you thank you very much sir uh, you please uh, stop sharing your screen uh, we are all very much convinced with the spongioplasty and we are all uh, following your footsteps uh, but we, we we today what we would like to know from the experts from the glob uh, after a couple of minutes when we start discussing the spongioplasty so with, the, with that i would like to invite next speaker uh, dr tariq please share your screen and he is uh, going to speak on the management of uh, distal hypospadias new insights and uh, step wise management algorithm he is from uh, doha qatar and uh, he is uh, his fellow is the uh, uh, dr abu bakar uh, hello yeah. everybody uh, can you yes. hear me 
Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, good day, uh, every, every, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to be with you in this webinar. This is the I'm Dr. Bakr Al Awad, Pediatric Urology Fellow, with Dr. Tariq Abbas, uh, Pediatric Urology attending from Sidra from Qatar. So, we are pleased today to present our talk about the management of distal hepatitis, new insights, and stepwise management. So we are going to talk about the current challenges, preoperative assessment, and then assessment of the severity of hepatitis, uh, new insights in hepatitis assessment and classification, and then finally the stepwise management algorithm. So the current uh, classification uh, and management of hepatitis uh, are highly subjective with lack of standardization with poor inter and intra-observer uh, agreement. Uh, the current decision-making algorithms are largely based on weak or limited uh, evidences. So these challenges include anatomical descriptions, uh, terminology, standardization, decision-making, and selection among different uh, hepatitis procedures. So uh, there are several hundred different uh, techniques uh, for repair of hepatitis, but, but most of them have been abandoned uh, due to the poor patient outcome. Uh, there is general tendency uh, towards urethral plate preserving procedures because of the good blood supply, good innervation, and the good uh, post-operative outcome at this example. Uh, depending on the quality of the urethral plate, uh, we have the three main procedures that we do for this hepatitis, like uh, duplay, tip, or the uh, dorsal inlative. Uh, then the preoperative assessment, we, we usually take uh, a good pre- and postnatal history and then we conduct comprehensive physical examination. And here we focus on two, uh, two critical points, which are the urethral plate quality and the presence uh, and degree of cordy of the penis. So regarding the urethral plate uh, assessment, we uh, conducted a systematic review and we found that urethral plate uh, is a predictor for the outcome. Based on this, we uh, developed uh, our plate objective scoring tool in our center. Uh, in which we have three landmarks, uh, A point, as you can see here, and then B point, and then C point. And this uh, score, um, the AB, uh, if the AB is greater than BC, then the plate is, is going to be more favorable. Um, then we, to make this more standardized, uh, standardized for the literal blade uh, assessment, uh, we use the AI. And then as you can see in the left image here, this is the input image, and then the AI generated the image on the right side, with calculation of the BOSS score. Uh, it is clearly it is a less favorable blade. Uh, to, um, to get this uh, application, just you can use this link to, uh, for this post uh, application. Uh, then we move to the uh, assessment of the benign curvature. Uh, we, we, we know that uh, Professor uh, Hadidi and his group, they did the uh, effort to help assess uh, benign curvature preoperatively by using the endoscrotal distance and using the natural uh, non-invasive erection test. However, we found that our BOSS score, again, uh, can predict the degree of the benign curvature. Um, regarding the interoperative assessment of benign curvature, uh, gonometer is commonly used, which is more objective than the uh, eyeballing. However, as you can see from these two models, it is uh, still, there is some degree of subjectivity. We have two models with different readings. Uh, then we, we published uh, a paper about the using of the uh, mobile application by using two Im uh, 2D images, uh, but this uh, technique just needs uh, a strict methodology. Um, we also use the AI-based medical visual uh, assessment. Um, and then uh, when we compare the uh, AI-based framework, which is the AccuCare, uh, with the other known three, uh, with the other three tools for assessment with black picture, we found that uh, comparing uh, the, 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 the eye polling is less precise and less accurate than uh, the goniometer is more accurate. And as we move on, the mobile application is more precise. And finally, the uh, AI AccuCare is more precise and accurate than all of these uh, the other three tools for assessment of the benign curvature. So uh, regarding the assessment of the severity of hepatitis, uh, so we, 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 we suggested the classification based on the true spongiosa bifurcation rather than the meter position, which is used in the previous classifications. So we, come, we came up with the visceral defect ratio 
And this ratio is calculated by uh, dividing the uh, uricil defect from this uh, imaginary line to B points uh, to the, the, the spongiose bifurcation. This is divided by the stre uh, stretched benign length. So this is the uricil defect ratio. Based on this, we have three grades, grade one, grade two, and three. Uh, and then based on all these, we uh, made this uh, algorithm management in our center. We are using this uh, algorithm in which we have three critical points. The first point is the uricil a defect ratio, and then we have the uh, measurement of the curvature, and then finally the post score. So based on these three critical points, the management is uh, tailored for each patient. Uh, this is a simplified version uh, for this, uh, for the management algorithm. It is mainly used for this type of radius. Again, we uh, concentrate or focus on the presence of, uh, of the core. You have a one minute to finish. Uh, assessment, yeah. Uh, yes, next. So in conclusion, uh, there are multiple perioperative factors and anatomical components uh, known to influence the most operative outcome. Uh, the benign curvature and recent plate assessment are key steps in evaluation and management of hypospadias. Previous uh, classification system uh, primarily uh, depend on the meter position uh, and not precisely define the true site of spondiosal bifurcation, which is very crucial, we think. And then future improvement in hypospadia care will require standardized evidence-based and objective management algorithms through the international collaboration. Uh, these two books uh, are products of our center. Uh, the right one is the hypospadiology book. And then on the left side, the video of the is coming soon. Um, and then all of you uh, are welcome to join us in our international symposium on hypospadiology in November 19, 2024. Uh, in Doha, Qatar, Thank you very much, Dr. Abu Bakr. You can stop sharing. Uh, we know, we all know Tariq is the very much uh, prominent uh, hypospodiologist of Asia, and uh, he's working very hard in standardizing the findings as well as uh, terminology. And we hope that there will be a good discussions following these two talk, two talks. So next is the from the team Brazil. Uh, that is from Dr. Ubira Chara Parasho and Isabella, and this speaking on our approach to penal imputation. You can uh, share the screen, Isabel. Dr. Priyank will give a warning at six minutes. Priyank. So good morning. Yeah. Good morning. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, sir. Recording progress. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, my name is Isabella. Isabella. I'm fellow. There is an echoing. Uh, uh, there is an echoing. Please uh, stop recording your own. I think the meeting is completely recorded. So you will get the recording of the entire meeting. Some echoing is started. So please go ahead. So good morning uh, from Brazil. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, my name is Isabella. I'm fellow at Federal University of Bahia. And today, on behalf of Dr. Ubirazara Barroso, I will present a case that illustrates our approach to penile amputation. So the case is a boy, JS, eight months old, and he was uh, he had his penile and scrotum amputated by a dog beating. Subsequently, his mother sought a medical uh, attention elsewhere, where doctors recommended uh, vaginoplasty and a suggestion that the mother declined. At, eight, uh, at 11 years old, the boy came to our clinic to, and was chosen to undergo a skin flap using the decastro technique. It's important to remember that the carpeta cavernosa stay in the perineal uh, area. And when this boy had uh, 18 years old, he wanted to have a penetrative sexual intercourse and was chosen to perform a procedure that we call total corpora mobilization, TCM. This technique uses the principle of the Kelly procedure and is carried out entirely through perineal via. The concept of the TCM is to remove the carpora cavernosa from the pubic bone and is cat tuberosit, leaving the periosteum attached to the penile shaft.
So the patient is placed in the lithotomy position and with a perineal incision in the midline. Uh, after that, a subperiosteal incision is made and the corpora cavernosa is detached from the pubic arc and the ischial The urethra is completely mobilized from the corpora cavernosa in order to increase the length of the penis. Subsequently, uh, the corpora cavernosa was mobilized upward and the periosteum that was left attached uh, was sutured to the pubis. The neurovascular bundle is preserved. Here in this video, we can see uh, um, we can see the corpora cavernosa is being mobilized, mobilized upward. Yeah. Hello. I think uh, there is uh, some problem with the uh, our connection. Hello. Yeah, central office. Uh, can you please uh, stop sharing? Yeah, please. So there was some problem with uh, her connection. So we'll come, we'll go back to her after a couple of minutes. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I request uh, Dr. Pradyot Saha Sai to present his uh, presentation uh, on the repair of Y configuration of urethral duplication. His mentor is Dr. Mukesh Arya, and they are from the Medical College uh, Bikanir. Mukesh is very popular reconstructive urologist in the field of pediatric urology. Yeah, go ahead. Good evening, Adiyot. sir. Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, greetings from Bikanir, India. And uh, we are presenting two cases of uh, 2A2 or the Y type urethral duplication, which is the most common symptomatic type of urethral duplication. In the Y type duplication, the corporal bodies and urethra may be dysgenetic. So they fall in the spectrum between penile dysgenesis and agenesis, which makes their reconstruction difficult. I experienced of two cases. The first case, a six-year-old male was managed with staged repair. His first stage has been done and is awaiting the second stage repair. This is another picture of the same case. The second case was a five-year male with a Y-type sagittal urethral duplication operated in February 2022. On examination, the external genitalia was normal except uh, left undescended testes. In investigations, the urine examination was normal. Ultras ultrasound showed right renal agenesis and the left testes was undescended and at superficial inguinal ring. The micturating cystourethrogram showed one normal urethra and another wider one with opening at anal verge without any VUR or paraurethral diverticula. He underwent orthopexy followed by single stage surgery. So coming to the video of the surgery, here we can see the Y type duplication in the five year old boy uh, with both the urethra cannulated. On urethroscopy, both the urethra was seen joining distal to the verumentanum. And the right ureteric orifice was not seen as the right kidney was absent. We started with infiltration of lignocaine with 1 in 1 lakh adrenaline around the urethral opening at anal verge, followed by mobilization of the urethra. It was finally an astomost end to side to the normal vulvar urethra. And through the anterior sagittal approach, the dissection of the proximal accessory urethra was done.
a stay suture was applied over the mobilized urethra. In these children, the accessory urethra is the main properly developed channel and the orthotopic urethra is often of small caliber and is dysgenetic. Now further dissection cranially towards the normal vulvar urethra was done. The bulbospongiosis muscle was separated and the bulbar urethra was opened in the midline. A five French ureteric catheter, which was passed from the normal meatus, was put into the accessory urethra. An end to side anastomosis of the accessory to the orthotopic urethra was done in a single layer using 5 0 vicral suture. A closure of the bulbospongiosis muscle was done. It was approximated in the midline, followed by closure of the wound, anal verge, and anal canal. Postoperatively, the patient was given IV antibiotics for three days, and the urethral stent was kept in situ for three weeks. This is a picture showing the completed closure. He avoided well on follow-up. The stream improved gradually with no residual urine and stable renal function. Please, please now, the treatment, op treatment options include repair in a single stage, a staged repair with, augment uh, with augmentation of the hyperplastic urethra. We can go for discarding the accessory urinal tract and instead incorporate the orthotropic patent posterior urethra. In patients with retention of urine who require SPC, we may be followed by metrophenol before surgical reconstruction. And in cases of strictures and multiple reoperations, the final option is metrophenol with bladder neck closure. Some advocate a masterly inactivity with a permanent perineal opening for voiding and a functional penis for sexual intercourse. It's a rare anomaly. Uh, so embryology is not well understood, but it's thought yes. to be due to incomplete development of urorectal septum. A preoperative pelvic MRI can help delineate the anatomy associated with multiple anomalies. And it's a very challenging reconstructive urological surgery with a high risk of stenosis and failure as uh, urethra is dysgenetic with poor muscular support. The ultimate aim is to protect the upper tract with long-term follow-up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pradyut. Uh, so you stop sharing. Uh, so uh, once again, I want to check with the Isabella. Uh, you are there. Uh, you can start uh, sharing again your screen and uh, finish the rest of the job quickly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. You have uh, three minutes. So you just go to the your important point. Yes. So this is the patient now uh, with uh, eight centimeters or, of a rectal penis and is we having a sexual intercourse with a sex for penetration. We're not able to see the like screen. Like we now? No, still not. Stop and try again once more.
you are almost 10 minutes delay it's not your fault no, only right uh, but uh, we can give you the later on opportunity if you still have some problem is that okay i, I think you have the slides on you so yes okay okay it's, yeah please yes can you see now uh half of the screen yeah make it yeah perfect perfect go ahead Please. So the patient now the has important point. Yeah, please. The patient now has eight centimeters of erectile penis and have a sexual intercourse with a sexual thorough penetration. Uh, here we can see a 24 years old patient with a micro penis and after the uh, TCM uh, procedure, uh, it's important to see this patient with uh, the long term follow uh, follow up and the, we can see a bigger and thicker penis. Uh, since we did also an enlargement of the penile shaft. This is another patient with a penile amputation for penile cancer. And you can see before and after the procedure here as well. And this is a, another patient that we are also doing um, TCM for trans males. And this patient is he's having a penetrating uh, penetrating his partner after the procedure and he is urinating in standing position. This is the last case of TCM for a penile cell transplantation. And here we can see the um, penopubic ligament and also the periosteum being approached. This is, uh, we also have done a uh, pubic dermolipectomy. And after that, we fix the penis to the pubic symphys. So uh, this patient now, uh, here is the final result. Uh, and the penis come from four centimeters to 12 centimeters tractionate. And in conclusion, the TCM can be performed with low risk of uh, neurovascular bundle, erectile and sensitive are preserved and Ocas had a penile shaft able to penetrate during sexual intercourse. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, stop sharing. Uh... Thank you very much once again, Isabella and uh, Dr. Baraso for this an excellent presentation. And with that, uh, we are opening the discussion. Uh, we will be giving entire 15 minutes, which we have decided, right? Uh, so I have a first question for Tariq. Tariq, uh, uh, do you exploit spongioplasty uh, uh, in your practice of hypospodias repair? And if yes, uh, are you convinced with the Dr. Park's talk, uh, talk or... Uh, you are doing uh, since long and why if you are not doing why not doing yes. and if you are doing why you are doing yeah i'm very convinced with the importance of spongioplasty uh, not only for a cut layer but also for the mechanical uh, uh, like support for the distal part at the urethroplasty level however it needs to be done the way that's being described by professor amilal to go laterally deep to the fascia to release it in a nice way. Uh, however, this does not preclude the need also for a secondary coverage layer, whether it is um, ventral dartus or dorsal dartus, at least in my experience. So my question is for Professor Amilal, do you need also, after doing the spongioplasty, to do any secondary coverage layer, or you will, uh, particularly in the double breast uh, way? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tariq, for asking this one. Here, as I did, decided, I told you that uh, we had a high fistula rate in the poorly developed spongiosum. In well-developed spongiosum, we don't use any of the other sporting tissue. Only we ventrally mobilize lateral dartos. We cover over that one and we do. And in our cases, in our uh, country, we use, usually do the preparation plasty along with that also. But in poorly developed cases where we think that as I showed in one of the cases, you can use all dorsal dartos, ventral dartos, or even if you de epithelized skin flap, or you can use the tunica vaginalis flap. That I usually use only in the proximal hypospedias where I am going for TIP in proximal hypospedias. Except, do you Thank think you. Uh, that spongioplasty gives a proper shape, anatomical shape, because the sponges should surround the urethral tube, or it also help in uh, reducing the fistula rate, genuinely? You see, you are asking me now? Yes. Yeah, you see, 
the, if we go by the anatomical principles after tubularize you see what is there the hypospadia is opening up the of the distal urethra so you mobilize the uh, the urethral plate and then do spongioplasty that reconstructs the near normal urethra as i shown in my that slide where you have uh, that is just almost a normal urethra so this will be not only this is the the only a conduit to uh, have the urinary flow but this is a functional urethra having with the spongiosum over it and this perfect. will prevent fistula also perfect so professor kaldemol do you have any comment on this uh, from your vast experience I, I i totally agree with dr bot i think the use of healthy spongiosum is a great addition not only in preventing fistulas but it also thinks it gives some substance to the urethra and i think it gives us a less likelihood that that urethra will dilate, particularly if there's any functional or temporary distal uh, resistance to flow that may occur with the glandular part of the urethra. But I also agree that in the more proximal cases and even in the mid-shaft cases, when the spongiosum doesn't look so healthy, that you really do need a good layer of vascularized tissue, wherever that's going to come from, uh, in order to uh, improve the uh, outcome results. So overall, I'm very, very supportive of Dr. Bott's approach. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Professor Tegul, do you have a question for Tariq? Uh, I have a question for Amila. Yes, uh, having seen your presentation, I think most of us are very supportive of using spongiosal tissue if it is present there. I wonder if you use the quality of the spongiosal tissue, a marker for the severity of the hypospadias and the long-term outcome. And I'd like to ask you the question, have you done uh, Euroflowometry studies after spongioplasty? Because what we mostly see in the, in the Euroflow study is that you have a flat curve or a plateau and I wonder if it is changing with the use of spongioplasty to a more normal looking bell shaped flow metry. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tuggul, for asking this a very nice question. Let me tell you. You see, initial, if you're taking the euro flow after three months or six months, it doesn't differ. But when you take it in a long follow up after one year, two years, and my follow up is up to the adolescence, we, I follow up them up to the age of 16 or 18. So in that case, that becomes almost normal, bell-shaped curve in all these, these cases. So this is a very supportive one. And especially in those cases where we find a very well-developed uh, this spongiosum that covers the, the Euroflow is almost normal. That's very good. Yeah. Thank you. Fine. So uh, we have uh, still 10 minutes to go. And uh, I have a question for Tariq. Tariq, uh, uh, how far you succeeded with this uh, uh, standardization in the plate identification quality and uh, how far it helped in improving your outcomes? Well, Genuinely, we it is it. possible to replicate or duplicate these things uh, by other centers because we know hypospodias is very tricky uh, condition where we have a lot of heterogeneity uh, case to case. Well, it's still, we did not study the, the long-term outcomes. However, it has uh, studying or standardizing the characteristics of urethral plate. Uh, it has helped us significantly to build up um, uh, a more objective uh, decision-making tool for us during the surgery, uh, particularly the post-score. However, there are still limitations with inter-observer and intra-observer uh, disagreement. That's why we started to use the AI uh, to help us so that uh, the, the idea of the AI here is just to take a picture of the ventral shaft of the penis and then it will help you to standardize the way that you assess the ultra plate quality based on, the, based on the post and based on other features that we are still building and then most likely we recommend the, the surgical procedure that's most likely will produce the, the least number of complications. Um, still, we did not okay. study the impact on okay. the post-operative outcomes. Okay. okay, so those who have a question, Anil, they can Anil, the thumb. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Malik. Uh, there is a question from the audience. Um, Kavan Takwan is asking, what is the long... Uh, this would be addressed to Amilal, sir. What is the uh, long... Amilal, but uh, you keep the question reserved. Uh, so we can give the chance to other 
if you if you don't have that other question, Malik, you can ask uh, uh, for the Y configuration to Mukesh if you want to ask. No, no, there are no other question. It Dr. Amira, why will keep the question is Can you help? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Dr. Emilio, would you like to ask question on uh, why configuration repair? Sir, Paul Marguren has raised his hand here. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Fine, Paul. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Questions for Amilal Bhatt right now. Good. Good morning. Like uh, Tony Curry and the Vanderbilt Group had published previously the spongial mobilization, basically mobilizing the spongial tissue from the corpora um, and using the antivirizing it. Um, and initially, the feeling was that that would also um, fix part of the ventral curvature just by separating the corpus spongiosum from the corpora carbonosa distally. Uh, you can po possibly fix the uh, ventral curvature. Is that what you have experienced also? That's one question. The second question to Dr. Uh, Abbas is, is the, um, I really like the algorithm that you've created. But I think the algorithm is a sophisticated way of putting, incorporating several parameters, urethral location, spongiosal separation, things like that. I think there's recent reports that have actually shown that you can use infrared technology to assess the quality of the tissues, because that's what really is needed, is, is assessing the quality of the tissues that you're, that you're using for reconstruction. Um, and that probably will be the next step in, 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 in incorporating artificial intelligence that actually can then um, de determine the quality of the tissue and then also predict outcomes based on that. Would you like your comment on that? So should, should I speak first? Yeah, uh, sir, uh, let us give some chance to Tariq and then we have a two more this, uh, this presentation to discuss a little bit. Nee, because Paul I have asked about the, six minutes. Call, I have a six minute. Paul, you, you can give, uh, you can give a bit precise answer. You give a precise Paul answer. Paul asked please. about the cardi. So let me uh, uh, answer it. 30 seconds. 30 uh, seconds. Professor Paul, the, the, yes, mobilization of the urethral plate and spongiosum corrects the mild curvature, preserving the urethral plate. And even proximal mobilization and preserving the urethral plate and growing the uh, TIP with supplementation of the tissue over the spongioplasty is my first choice. And I agree with the uh, that group that they mobilize it and correct the curvature. Agree. I We also agree yeah. with you. Yeah, Tariq, 30 seconds. Yeah, thank, you very much. thank you very much, Dr. This is a very important question. Uh, AI has potentially the ability to uh, merge a lot of data uh, so that we you can... You can uh, pull it in one place, and then you build your decision-making and even predictions. Uh, one of the things is that also we are studying the genetic um, uh, findings of the prepuce, so of the dartos, of the prepuce, of the spongiosa for this patient. So infrared um, uh, light uh, imaging is also very much potential. All these efforts just to make it as standardized as possible for decision-making to select the best uh, tool and predict accurately the outcomes. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, Kalpna I and have PJ. One. First, P uh, yeah, PJ, go ahead and Kalpna. No, no, Kalpa, Kalpa, ma. go yeah, ahead. Kalpna. I... Yeah, please, go ahead, Kalpna. Oh, thank you, PJ. You're always so polite. Uh, my question was to Dr. Amilal Bhatt. Maybe uh, I missed ma it. Ma uh, uh, Kalpna, hmm. can I request you? Because see, uh, uh, it will be one-sided discussion. Okay, can we can we do something for that? I request all of you, uh, if it's okay, and then you can ask question. Yeah, go ahead. Can I ask? Yes. My question was to Dr. Amil Albert. The um, surgical technique that he described, does it produce good results in all redo cases as well? Sir, Amil Albert, sir. Again, unmute yourself, sir. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, thank you, ma'am. You asked this question. This is a very good question. You see, we usually take that the reoperative cases and we will not find spongiosum. 
in very many cases i in my cases even in 70% of the cases even after two and three surgery i find this spongiosum if this spongiosum is available then mobilize and then cover after covering the fistula or the even if you have tubularized this one distal plate after putting in the uh, dorsal graft then also do spongioplasty that will cover this will give you a knee and normal urethra Okay. Perfect. Okay. Maybe not so, very last very... question from PJ uh, for this segment. Hello. And uh, just for the knowledge of all, uh, C prefers Kalpna over the male. Can I ask to yes. Vira? Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Um, thank you, Vira. It's always a very good topic that you raise here with the increase of the size of the penis. A lot of people were taking notes about that. I know that. So, um, my question is. Um, do you have a, a cutting age for offering this to the patients? If I have a four years old patient that have some kind of bite, I know that um, it's a case that was in the south of Chile, Ricardo Yanis is around there. They have a horse beaten the penis. Any age that you will offer this kind of surgery? Thanks for your question, PJ. Uh, in the first cases, we do for this kind of a dramatic cases uh, that uh, because it's a kind of uh, technique that uh, we train before in cadavers and uh, but there is a kind of risk to damage the neurovascular bundle. So then we got confidence to do a more looking normal penis. So we start doing this for micro penis. So uh, asking your question for a uh, four old boy. I would be confident to do uh, this, uh, the TCM to a uh, boy with micropenis. Uh, no worries. Thank you, Brian. Okay. okay. Thank you. So uh, we move to the second uh, section. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the all the speakers and their mentors. And with that, uh, we move to the next presentation that is on the posterior through wall section. That is from the... Uh, Evelina Women's and uh, Children's Hospital, uh, Dr. Ellen, Ellen, the speaker, by mentoring by the Srividya Sankaran and Kalpana Patil. She is speaking on the fetal lower urinary obstruction timing of prenatal intervention. So please share your screen. You have seven complete minutes to speak on this topic. If type permits, we have some time uh, in the end. We'll be taking the discussions further on the hypospodias and other topics. Yeah, um, I'm just getting the. Yeah. Um, so you can hear me and see our slides. Hello. No, we are seeing your slides, but you have to make full screen. Okay, it should be. It's not full screen yet. No, okay. No. Bottom, bottom. Go to the bottom otherwise. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Make um, full screen. Oh, this should. It seems to be full screen on mine. I'm so sorry. Um. If you go to the bottom left, Ellen. Yeah, that's what I've done yeah, yeah, on mine. Full screen. <laughs> it's okay. You can go ahead with this. No. Oh, I, I just let me try one more time to get it um, to the full screen. I'm so sorry. It uh, worked yesterday. yesterday. Yesterday, you will be. You was able to do it very quickly. It was the yes, first I know. Quickly, yeah. Any luck? Is that full screen? No. No, no, it's not still full screen. But uh, you can go ahead with the presentation. We are seeing very well. Okay, I just would prefer. Is that full screen? No, no. Oh. Uh, so, Alan, you can share the current screen on uh, the settings in the uh, yeah, so in the share screen mm -hmm. uh, tab. Yeah. On the share screen tab, you can actually select which screen you want to share. Yeah, it's showing me, but it's just not um, showing you guys. That's my problem. Still not full screen, I assume. Anil, do you want to go to speaker two? Yeah, that oh, is what, what? Uh, let, let her rectify her problem. I think you might be in presenter mode, and that's the reason why you're not able to share full screen. So if you just go out of presenter mode and just do 
Okay. Yeah. Slide, I slide show view, then it'll show you. There you go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's okay, you can just go ahead not with this. Sharing the correct then... screen. You have to see, you, you close all your windows, just open this presentation and then you share. Uh, right? Should yeah. I go to the second presenter or you are trying again? Yeah. Once quickly? If you have I'll some other things to... open, don't uh, keep it open. Yeah, that's the only thing I have, unfortunately. So open yeah, the presentation perfect. completely. Yeah. There is a suggestion that probably this is not the screen which you shared. So close all windows quickly. Yeah, I, they, I promise they are indeed all closed. Um, I'm happy for you to put For us, and we don't want to lose your presentation. Me neither. Um, Oh, goodness. I think I need to go to present to two and then we'll rectify this and come back. Yeah, yeah. So are you able to make a full screen once again? Okay, fine. Fine. So we are going to the second presentation by Dr. Prasanna's team. They are from the NU hospital. He is going to speak on the point of technique for pew valve fulguration. And it is by the presenter is the Dr. Uh, Sri Surya Shruti. Yeah, please go ahead, Shruti. You can share your screen and you have a complete seven minutes for you. It is 6.17. You share your screen. Suruti, you are there? Prashanna? Unmute yourself, Prashanna, please. Yeah. Hi, Anil. Good evening. Yeah. If uh, Suruti is not there, you can share the screen and start presenting. One minute. No issues. It's one and same. Um, Anil, just just go to this uh, next speaker. No, let me just check, please. Give me two minutes. Oh, anyway. I think she can present like this only. Yeah, you can. Or otherwise, what you can do is that you stop sharing, you just uh, log in again, and then come back with the... I'm extremely sorry for this uh, spoilage of the time to all the viewers. Uh, we did rehearse yesterday, but uh, somehow it is not working right now. Can I request no, why, all why, 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 uh, people to remain uh, ready, to be ready for the presentation? Paul, are you there? Sir, I'm here. Uh, Anil, yeah, okay. Anil, Shruti, Anil, Shruti will be sharing now, Anil. Perfect. Go ahead, Shruti. All right, I'm off. Shruti? Not able to see Shruti still. No, this is not working, Shruti. Anil, can I say something? Yes, please, ma'am. Um, yeah, I think you have uh, Ellen's presentation. She's just not going into the slideshow. So okay, okay. my suggestion okay. would be after this presentation, if you can do the slides, she can do yeah, the talk. Let, uh, let me try. Yeah, we'll okay. do it. Okay. Yeah, by that time, if she can uh, uh, rectify, yeah. we yeah. definitely see that she can do it. Yeah. Sure. Suruti, go ahead. Make it full screen. My God. Hello, sir. Are you able to see the full screen, sir? Yeah, I'm able to see, but you have to make it full screen if you want. Session two is jinxed with this. Sruti, yesterday we rehearsed also your yes. presentation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Perfect. Sir. Perfect. Yeah, Thank go you. Ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. My apologies to everyone for this delay. Uh, Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Shruti, and uh, along with my mentor, Dr. Prasanna Venkatesh, sir, and on behalf of NU Hospitals Bangalore, India, 
I thank the organizing committee and Anil Takwani sir for this opportunity. I'll explain our uh, hospital's point of technique for the PUE fulguration and its outcomes. So what is the relevance? So with the increased availability of the ultrasound imaging and uh, increased the diagnosis of the posterior urethral wall antenatally and hence earlier presentation of the patients to the urologist. So, and the newborn has a very small bladder capacity of only 30 ml, which only increase, which increases 30 ml per year. And uh, on the other hand, the irrigation inflow, for example, in a 6 bar 7.5 French cystoscope with a Bugby electrode is uh, 95 ml per minute. That is, it uh, hardly takes uh, 20 seconds for the bladder to fill up. This we can see the flow in a 6 bar 7.5 French cystoscope with a Bugby electrode. And even in a five-year uh, child, it uh, takes uh, only two minutes for the bladder to fill up. And uh, hence, the surgeon each time has to check for the bladder over distension or the rise in the intravesical pressures and uh, stop and empty. Approximately uh, three to four times uh, during a PUE fulguration, which uh, actually amounts to 10 to 15 minutes of the time. And uh, hence, we devise a simple solution in the form of suprapubic IV cannula into the bladder along with a IV drip set and uh, hence to provide the continuous irrigation and drainage and this is based on the Rutas principle in the Iglesias receptoscope and the precautions we have to take are to avoid the kink in the IV set, IV cannula, it is to be fixed upright to the drapes and also the IV set can be cut short such that the end is within the field of vision of the surgeon to check for the continuous drainage, that is to make sure that there is no block. The advantages are uh, because of the low intravesical and intrarenal pressures, there is a reduced low infection rates and hence the antibiotic usage and the hospital stay and also the reduced endoscopy time by around 10 to 15 minutes per procedure and because of the faster irrigation, the better vision. And uh, this being a very simple technique with a short learning curve due to the familiar anatomy. And even the cost is only five US dollars. That is uh, around uh, four, three, 300 to 400 rupees only. So these are the instruments we use. That is a six bar 7.5 French cystoscope with a Bugby electrode or 11 French uh, receptoscope in an elderly child with a Collins knife. And KLS Martin and Herb diathermy machines also. So this is a cystoscopy, able to identify the wall and also note its extent. And uh, once we identify it, we can insert a suprapubic IV cannula and then attach the Collins knife or the Bugby electrode. And uh, we set the cautery at 80 watts and check the cautery over the bladder mucosa <laughs> as a trial cautery. And if you are not able to identify during the cystoscopy, initial cystoscopy, while withdrawing the cystoscope, we will be able to identify the posterior urethral wall and then also note its extent. So this is a video showing the PUV incision at five o'clock. So with the, the edge of the valve is put to the tip of the electrode and sequentially. And each time the valve is to be stretched and uh, incision is to be done only when the tip of the electrode can be seen through the valve. This is to avoid the injury to the uh, other important uh, urethral mucosa. And the peripheral 1 to 2 mm of the valve may not be fulgurated. This is to decrease the urethral stricture rates. So after the 5 o'clock incision, we move on to the 7 o'clock incision. And as required, even the 12 o'clock incision will be made. And uh, post fulguration, we this good urine flow post PUV fulguration. And uh, this is our data. Over the past 20 years, we have done PUV fulguration in 88 children, out of which uh, four are lost to follow. And uh, the children age is ranging from 13 days to 14 years, and the mean age is four years. And the mean follow-up period is uh, four years, 11 months. And uh, in, our, in our experience, there is no periop uh, urine tract infections or the urethral strictures during follow-up. And uh, the refulguration rate is 12.5%.
so the discussion being uh, greater than 30 millimeters of uh, mercury pressure will then the threshold time is uh, reduced to 50 seconds only because to avoid the infections up now the maximum safe value as we all know is a 30 mm hg or 40 centimeters of water and uh, with the high uh, intravesical and intrarenal pressures the sepsis rates will increase up to 10 percent apart from other complications like the hemorrhage and urinoma. So our conclusion is with the simple technique of a suprapubic IV cannula with the IV drip set, which is a very low cost, we can reduce the morbidity to the patient and also I put it as morbidity to the surgeon also and also the cost of the patient. Thank you everyone. Anil, Anil, please uh, unmute yourself. So, uh, so uh, I request Dr. Paul Campbell to present uh, this uh, talk on use of catheterization in patients with the posterior was Very important uh, talk uh, and uh, is mentored by the Pramod Reddy. They are from the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Dr. Paul, please share your screen. So recently at Istanbul, we were listening, uh, I think, Philip Rensley, and he said that if I have to live my life again, uh, then I would like to prefer to do more and more catheterization in the patients of pure wall. Maybe it is a day CIC or a nighttime drainage, and if required, I will go. I will not hesitate to do mitrofenoc for time being, but that saves many patients from going for the ESRD. So, Paul, very important uh, presentation. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, you guys can see my screen okay? Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much yeah, for having me. We're seeing your in. presenter mode. You're seeing our presenter. Sorry, we are seeing your presenter mode. Oh. Presenter yeah. mode. You can just change a little bit. You might just want to swap screens. Yeah. Are you on two screens, Paul? If you are, share the other screen. Let's try. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay. So my name is Paul Campbell. Thank you for having me. I'm a fellow at Cincinnati Children's, and today I'll be presenting on the use of catheterization in posterior urethral valve patients. So posterior urethral valves are the most common cause of obstructive uropathy in children and account for over 10% of all children with end-stage renal disease. There are many proposed contributing factors to the progression to ESRD, including renal dysplasia from abnormal embryologic development, VUR, which is present in over 50% of valve patients, recurrent UTIs, and a poorly functioning bladder with pressure-induced renal injury. The renal decline tends to be progressive with an estimated 50% having some degree of CKD and further 30% with ESRD by the time of adulthood. The urologist is essential in managing the bladders of these patients in an effort to avoid kidney disease progression. The term valve bladder was first used in the 1980s and was an attempt to explain the bladder dynamics secondary to prolonged fetal obstruction. Even with early surgery to incise the valves, the obstruction continues to an, contributes to an increased collagen to smooth muscle ratio, and as children age, can predispose them to poorly compliant fibrotic bladders with poor contractility. While not all patients are the same, the typical pattern seen on UDS is a hypercontractile overactive bladder early on, with progression to a poorly sensate, poorly compliant hypocontractile bladder as the patient ages. The compounding factor to bladder emptying is the degree of polyuria many of these patients have. The poorly concentrated high urine volumes and chronic state of bladder distension due to poor emptying or pseudo PVRs from refluxed urine potentiate the cycle of bladder fibrosis and contribute to myogenic failure, putting the kidneys at further risk. A great example of the pseudo residual that occurs in, in a kid with PUV. So as the bladder empties, urine refluxes into the upper tracts, and as soon as voiding is complete, the bladder just quickly refills, constantly being in a state of stretch. Every effort must be laid to limit the progression of renal stage disease secondary to a poorly functioning bladder, and this is done through active bladder management. Patients need to have regularly scheduled follow-up with appropriate imaging in labs, urodynamics, and or VCUGs. Behavioral modifications such as time voiding or double voiding are often the initial step. Medications may be required to improve emptying, decrease overactivity, or improve bladder compliance. Eventually, these children may progress to requiring intravesical Botox or further surgical procedures, However, one of the essential aspects of an active bladder management program is the use of urethral catheterization. 
The use of catheters is essential in the management of poorly compliant, poorly emptying bladders that are not capable of handling the polyuria often seen in PUV patients. As this is an intrinsic issue within the kidney, urine volumes cannot be reduced by water deprivation alone. Scheduled CIC regimens can help ensure appropriate emptying of the bladder, drainage of residual urine within dilated upper tracts, and avoid pseudo-PVRs associated with reflux. Overnight catheter drainage is a frequent management strategy to avoid the distension of the bladder during sleeping hours, reduce storage pressures, and just give the bladder a rest. The use of catheterization, whether it be CIC or overnight drainage, can improve upper tract dilation in a significant amount of patients with polyuria and poorly compliant bladders. Nguyen were able to show improvement in hydrouterine nephrosis in 88% of patients on overnight drainage regimen. This is also supported by King, who started CIC in overnight drainage and found a mean reduction in APD of 14.2 millimeters. Likewise, both Duany Shanley and Koff showed improved hydrouterine nephrosis with overnight catheterization alone. Catheterization can also have an impact on continence and recurrent urinary tract infections. Over 35% of children with PUVs will have some form of voiding dysfunction with delays in toilet training, increased frequency, and day and nighttime enuresis. Incomplete emptying and high pressure voiding can also predispose children to recurrent UTIs. The use of overnight catheters in children with polyuria has been shown to have a resolution of urinary incontinence in up to 55% of patients. Similarly, Homdahl et al. found that in boys recommended to be on a CIC regimen but were non-compliant had higher rates of incontinence compared to those who were adhering to a CIC plan. With the use of continuous overnight catheterization, there has been shown to be a significant reduction in the number of hospitalizations and antibiotic treatment rates secondary to febrile UTIs. Up to 50% of PUV patients will be recommended to begin a CIC overnight catheter drainage program by 14 years of age, and this is largely associated with poor bladder compliance and progressive declining renal function. By utilizing a catheter regimen, Hale was able to demonstrate that upper tracts can drain freely at lower bladder pressures and improve bladder compliance. Multiple other studies have shown an improvement in bladder compliance on urodynamics following the institution of a catheter regimen. The optimization of bladder dynamics can be crucial not only to protect the native kidneys, but also help to avoid the potential need for surgical procedures and to potentially protect a transplant should it be required. Children recommended for a catheterization regimen are more likely to have worse renal function compared to those who are not. The goal of catheter regimens is to preserve existing renal function and avoid pressure-induced renal injury. Both Hale and Koff were able to show stabilization or improvement in renal function with the use of catheterization. Montaigne et al. found an attenuation in the rate of renal decline and prolonged the predicted time to ESRD by a mean of 12.2 years with overnight catheterization. Rickard et al. also showed a significant delay in the progression to dialysis with the use of a catheterization regimen. Ultimately, a number of children with poor renal function will progress to ESRD ultimately, but delaying the need for dialysis and or transplant can have a significant impact on the overall health of the child and avoid morbidity associated with early dialysis, long-term immunosuppression, and possibly the need for multiple transplants over a lifetime. Should the patients progress to transplant, the bladder must be effectively managed as transplant kidneys can be extremely susceptible to high pressures, infection, and impaired drainage. Patients with LUDO have been shown to have worse five-year graft survivals compared to those who don't. In patients with posterior urethral valve specifically, Amnesty showed that 10-year graft survival was significantly improved in children on a CIC regimen versus those who were not. Even if patients who had a previous surgical procedure, such as an augment or metrofenoff, there appears to be equivocal graft outcomes so long as the bladder is properly managed with catheterizations. Many providers are reluctant to start catheterization due to the concern of a sensate urethra or difficulty with an elevated bladder neck. However, this has not been our experience. Similarly, Alpert et al. reported on 20 patients with sensate urethras and found that 80% of families learned in a single clinic visit. Holmdahl also reported on their catheterization program and found an average of one week to master catheting using a stepwise approach in clinic. Making catheterization a part of the everyday routine can make a seemingly difficult task well accepted and normal for these patients and families. The use of a catheter regimen in patients with PUV can potentially have significant effects on upper tract dilation, continence, bladder compliance, and delay the progression to ESRD. This is something that can be taught, is fully reversible, and does not have the morbidity associated with surgical procedures. Even with its use, some children will have continued renal decline. However, delaying the need for renal transplant by even a few years can have a significant impact on the overall health of the child. 
In those who ultimately receive a transplant, management of the bladder with catheterization is necessary to prolong the life and limit the number of future transplantations. Thank you very much for your time. Sir, please unmute yourself. Anil, you're muted. So thank you very much, Paul, for this uh, timely completed presentation. And with that, Alan is sharing the screen. Yeah, so go for full screen. Once again, very important topic and very much uh, we are interested to know about this. Uh, and uh, there will be good uh, discussions follow this presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much um, to the Urological Society of India for having our team to present today. And sorry for the IT difficulties. My name is Ellen Callan. I'm a clinical fellow in fetal medicine. And on behalf of Dr. Sankaran and Mrs. Patil, a um, pediatric urologist, will present a case of fetal lower urinary tract obstruction with prenatal intervention. So our case was a 37 year old para two who presented for her dating scan in this pregnancy at 14 you weeks. To change your, uh, sorry, Ellen. Uh, yep. You to change this, yeah, please. Oh, are we still not seeing my slides? Yeah. So next uh, by the three, three, uh, you have to just uh, see that where well, you have to just. Yeah, I think we are seeing now, uh, Ellen. Uh, yeah, should I share? Oh. Okay. Yeah, I you can share because mine, on two different computers is unsuccessful in sharing. Is That's that working now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. perfect. So go I'm going to, to mute video. myself and I'll move it when you say next. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Sankaran. Um, so we are seeing then the first scan in this pregnancy. Um, the patient was 14 weeks and five days. To the left of the screen, um, in the top image, we can see the fetal head and the abnormality is obvious on this initial image. Um, the echo per area in the centre of the screen is the fetal bladder, which is significantly enlarged for this gestation in pregnancy. On some diameters, it measures up to 44 um, millimetres. To the right of the screen, um, we can see the fetal spine is anterior and this is a cross section through the fetal abdomen. Mm. We can see again the fetal bladder is enlarged and at the bottom of the screen we can see what is described um, in early scans as a typical keyhole sign um, of a distended fetal bladder. Um, we also noted at this stage that the fetal renal pelvises were dilated for this mm. stage in pregnancy. So on the next um, slide, um, we note that this patient was referred to our fetal medicine department based on the findings of her initial scan. Based on the findings in a likely male fetus, it was felt that these um, ultrasound findings were in keeping with a lower urinary tract obstruction, most likely in keeping with posterior urethral valves with a finding of a distended bladder and bilateral hydronephrosis. Of note in fetal medicine, it was found that there was no other structural abnormalities detected at this gestation and the amniotic fluid was normal. The diagnosis was discussed with the parents and the options were covered of no intervention, but with um, the complications that would ensue from this. At this stage in pregnancy, from sort of 16 weeks onwards, um, once the fetal kidneys take over, the baby produces urine, and this is the amniotic fluid. Without the amniotic fluid, the fetal lungs do not develop, and this would therefore lead to, after the baby was delivered, um, pulmonary and renal dysplasia, which could then lead to long-term renal dysfunction, the need for dialysis, and also transplantation. The option of interruption of the pregnancy was discussed. The family were committed to the pregnancy, declined invasive testing, so decided if they were a candidate, they wished to have a visico-amniotic shunt. Following an MDT discussion, the case proceeded to a visico-amniotic shunt. So at 16 plus three weeks gestation in the fetal medicine department, um, mum attended as a day case. Um, she received IV access and a one-off dose of IV antibiotics. Under ultrasound guidance and aseptic technique, the Cook-Harrison fetal bladder shunt was inserted. 
So using a 13 gauge um, trocar um, under ultrasound ga uh, guidance, the needle is inserted through the maternal abdomen into the amniotic fluid and into the fetal bladder. And then the um, pigtail catheter is deployed. It sits within the fetal bladder with one side within the fetal bladder and the other um, on the outside of the fetal abdomen. The procedure was performed without complication. A plan was made then to follow up mum in fetal medicine one week after the procedure. At this stage, um, during the procedure, we also took a sample of amniotic fluid. So on the screen, we can see um, highlighted the fetal shunt. It's echo bright. So the two umbilical arteries are um, splitting and it's on either side of the fetal bladder. And the fetal shunt is within the fetal bladder. And to the right of the screen, we can see that the shunt extends outside the fetal abdomen. Mum was subsequently followed up three weeks post shunt um, on the next slide um, and we can see um, this was mum's anatomy scan which would be routine practice um, to have. We can see the fetal kidneys um, and we can see that the fetal bladder is not distended although the bladder wall is thickened. Of note at this scan, the other structures of the BB were also assessed. There were no other structural abnormalities. Baby's thorax and lungs appeared normal. And reassuringly, the amniotic fluid was also normal at this stage in pregnancy. Mum was subsequently followed up two weekly in the fetal medicine department with no complications until 37 weeks. However, at 37 weeks, which was 11 weeks post shunt, it was noted that there was severe hydronephrosis. On this transverse section, we can see um, severe hydronephrosis with dilatation of the renal pelvises. The fetal bladder was not distended, although the bladder wall was still thickened, but it was noted that the shunt did not appear to be within the bladder at this stage. The um, amniotic fluid was normal. However, in view of the gestation of 37 weeks and three days with severe hydronephrosis, um, and bilaterally dilated ureters, the decision was made for delivery. So um, mum was delivered by a planned cesarean section at 37 plus six weeks gestation um, and a live male infant was delivered in good condition. There was no need for ventilation after delivery and the baby was transferred to the neonatal unit for ongoing care. So postnatally, um, moving on then one minute to the course. Yes. So the next slide. Um, immediately after delivery, um, we uh, the baby was reviewed. There was no urine outrip, so catheterization was performed and an ultrasound was performed day zero. This showed bilateral hydronephrosis. Serum creatinine peaked day one at 100. Um, baby remained as an inpatient and an MCUG was performed one week postnatal when creatinine fell. This um, confirmed the antenatal suspicion of posterior urethral valves. A cystoscopy was performed with resection of the posterior urethral valves two weeks postnatally with no complications. 12 months postnatally, um, a laparoscopic orchidopexy was performed and now almost two years on, um, our baby is awaiting a second stage of the orchidopexy. He was discharged home um, three weeks postnatal with a serum creatinine of 37 and currently serum creatinine is 25. He remains on prophylactic trimethoprim and is having clean intermittent catheterization, but with very minimal post void residuals. Um, so thank you very much for listening uh, to this case presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, please stop sharing your uh, screen. And uh, with that, uh, we have uh, uh, another 10 minutes for discussion. And those who have questions, they uh, raise your thumb. So. A uh, couple of questions were there from Prasant Bulankar. If you can come to the uh, able to ask question, uh, then we'll be allowing him to ask. Uh, before that, let us go to the Chandra Singh. Chandra, you can ask your question. Yeah, Chandra, unmute yourself. Dr. Chandra Singh, unmute, unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, please go yeah. ahead. Allowing you to unmute. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Prasna. Thank you for that wonderful presentation. My question is to uh, Dr. Pramod and team. In terms of the nighttime drainage, uh, I has been a lot of for as well. Your over... audio is a bit problem. Yeah. Can you correct it? You hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the question is 
do you have a low threshold to do a pure mitra pranav to enable nighttime drainage what is your opinion on that so that if further we will be privileged oh um i don't know if dr reddy saw and i know he has cases this morning but we we don't we generally will recommend for urethral catheterization in, in an overnight urethral foley um you know typically with our experience these kids can learn they can learn to do catheterization the families can do it and once it's a part of the routine the sensate urethra it's there but it, they become used to it and if you start them younger it's much much easier to to get buy in for catheterization than it is when obviously they're 10 11 12 um and then the metrofenaf is typically only absolutely if there is zero chance they're going to tolerate it um and there's other options too you can do something like putting in a mickey button we'll put those like a little g2 button we'll put those in the bladder too if we need to um that's another option that can also buy time from a metrofenaf but most of our kids we'll only do metrofenaf if they're absolutely unable to and really in our experience with good teaching and just you know helping the patients too and if you need a psychologist to help them that's also another good thing to do but the catheterization is typically very tolerated from the urethra i agree Thank you. yeah so malik go ahead with your question yeah my question is to dr kalpana and steep and the team uh, are we actually now uh, revisiting the whole concept that uh, uh, early intervention would uh, improve the kidneys uh, in these kinds of situation or are we looking at only a pulmonary survival the survivor and uh, as we thought that when we do an antenatal uh, intervention yeah i think that's a, a very good question one of the reason we presented this case is i think you know we have evidence from some studies which put lots of heterogeneous cases and hence the outcome looks quite dismal um but now we do increasingly 12 week scans so we have an opportunity to pick up these cases early um and then by 16 weeks when we offer the intervention so there is no you know in the past we were picking these cases at 20 weeks or later so the lung hypoplasia has already happened because of anhydromnias so definitely for the lung survival when we do at 16 weeks it does improve number 2 is you know this case has also given us the confidence that even though in the literature it says only there is severe poor renal um, outcome for these cases actually when you select your cases appropriately when you do it at the right time and when it works you know you can re, uh, get a good outcome it is very hard because we know the difficulties of uh, doing randomized control trial um, in this which has been tried in the past kalpana what do you think um this is a subject which is very close to my heart and it is a very difficult situation but i entirely agree with shri that selection of patient is important and if you review the literature at least the current literature in the 20th century there are several parameters uh from different parts of the world and i uh, like to look at ruano's classification where he categorizes them into four stages and all these um, so to say categorization just helps us to pick cases which will benefit from intervention because intervention has its own potential complications selection of appropriate uh, patients is very important and i think the other important thing to keep in mind is we are not doing this intervention to achieve everything like even in this patient which was presented the kidney has got cortical cysts uh but the renal function is good so we can claim that early intervention has protected the kidneys from further damage so right. i think doing it early has its role right but Thank patient you. selection is very important right agree so there is a question from prashant to uh, uh, prashanna that what is iglesia resectoscope can you explain that yeah prashant you can ask directly question you have one or two questions uh, yeah anil it's just a comment i i mean to say that the iglesia principle is the seat in a seat whereas the reuter is whatever we present is the reuter principle it's not a iglesia principle whatever we have presented that's what i'm saying okay okay 
and second thing you wanted to hide uh, ask about the height or the pressure of the fluid so no, that, like that. that i that was a, that was a wrong question by me i thought that 30 cm of 30 mm of hg uh, is too high no it's not too high 30 mm of hg is around 40 cm of water i just uh, tried in a unit converter uh, uh, anil anil see the point here is with posterior urethral valve most of the time we don't uh, analyze the amount of bladder distension so simple way is to just drain the bladder the iglesias resectoscope uses the continuous drainage what we generally do in turp so in this way we have just modified it to use a cannula in the suprapubic region and it's so your uh, youngest patient youngest patient on this technique newborn it is more newborn. useful the younger they are because okay and uh, you use the resectoscope even in the, in the very uh, small unit pardon resector you use resectoscope routinely for the no. small unit also no we use the cystoscope in the small neonate but whether you use the cystoscope or resectoscope just use a suprapubic cannula to drain the bladder so what happens is it saves you a lot of trouble that's all perfect perfect so anil can i ask a question yes 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 why my question is to paul um maybe because of the technical glitch i may not have picked it, picked it up but in the setup of catheterizing these uh, babies children i think uh, it's very important to have a support network of nurse specialists do you agree yes i i think that to have someone cuz let's be honest you're in clinic you're busy you're seeing patients you can't spend necessarily the time all the time that it takes to to train a family cuz it's it can take you know most of the clinic sessions like from home though they spend an hour with the family the uh the nurse the nurses who do it so to have a nurse specialist who knows how to teach how to do cic yes, is is hugely beneficial i agree with you 100% um and if not what we've done is they've come in when you don't have clinic or come after and train them because ultimately if you can get them cathing you can end up saving yourself a lot of time in the future as well um because they're taking care of themselves and just to follow on on that um when you start catheterization when they are babies mm -hmm. it's relatively easy mm -hmm. but once they approach the terrible 2 age mm -hmm. things go off the cliff do you have any suggestions at that stage so you know really with it's actually harder it's easier when they've been cathing since they were babies to carry it on into two because it's the normalcy for the child and the family they're used to cathing it's part of their life it's harder to start when it's they're potty trained and then you're trying to start catheterization um and for a lot of these kids too if they can't a psychologist also is extremely helpful in talking to these patients and in helping the child cuz really what they want the kid wants meaning right he's like i'm peeing i'm good but no you're not and help helping having someone to help them understand that peeing doesn't mean you're peeing safely it is super is very very important um for these kids so a lot of times too a psychologist will will really help and can decrease some of the anxiety associated with the catheterizations and uh, i have a small comment on this question that in my experience i am ex absolutely agree with the poll and promos finding that uh, the baby who starts be put on the cac in a very early uh, days they generally do very fairly well even when they start going to school so in my experience uh, i have i'm absolutely agree with the poll and the promos finding so can we have uh, some quick comment on this uh, concluding this uh, so Professor Kaldemon, you want to share your experience on the cathing these children, if required? Well, I I hundred a hundred percent agree with uh, Dr. Campbell on this, and we have not hesitated to bring in psychology in order to help out in the older child we'd like to place on a catheterization program because their input is essential in getting them to accept this, and it can take a while. You have to be patient, and we have been. Um, uh how happy uh, with the use of temporizing procedures such as a mickey button uh in order to uh, gain some time in some of these children as well i think you have to pull out all the guns you have to use all the options available 
because there's no question, as Dr. Campbell emphasized, that getting that bladder drained not only helps their bladder function long term, but certainly helps their upper tracts as well. And I think that's a key component to um, help with kidney function in these uh, in these patients with posterior root of valves long term. I do have one question for Dr. Cowan. Uh, I was impressed with the results in that particular case. But I've noticed with our maternal fetal medicine team that sometimes that initial placement of a catheter requires multiple placements over time. And I was wondering if they had any experience with earlier um, vesicle amniotic shunt failures and requiring multiple procedures. Yes, definitely. There are cases, you know, where with the baby's movements and as the baby grows, um, there are occasions, Kalpana would remember in the past, we have done, you know, three or four shunts through uh, yeah. one pregnancy yeah. and it works. Every time when we do an intervention, you know, we have to remember the risk of miscarriage and preterm delivery. Usually in these uh, situations, right. the parents are more for intervention irrespective of the complications of the intervention. Um, yeah. But we, you know, when it's when we it comes to second, third, and if there are more changes on the kidney, so we do include fresh counseling saying, look, you know, the outcome may not be as good as we thought it would be during the first insertion. Um, yeah, so we need to include uh, what happens between the shunts as well in the uh, counseling when we do the subsequent shunts. Thank you. I don't, I don't have the stats on this, quite honestly, but maybe you do. Would you say that the longevity of the shunt that you put in that didn't seem to work pretty well up until 37, 16 weeks to 37 weeks is more the exception rather than the rule? I, I agree. You know, uh, these shunts are becoming rarer these days because most parents go for termination. So we get yeah. very few patients and a very clean case like this because some of the cases we put shunt in, already the bladder had ruptured and there was urinary ascites. Um, yeah, I think this is maybe one of the couple of cases where the single shunt worked till the end. Can I, can I just add something to yeah, that? Uh, yeah, Three yeah, very seconds. quickly. Like, please go ahead. Oh, 30 seconds. This is the last comment here, yeah, please. Yeah, so basically, uh, just referring to Tony's uh, question, there was psycho, I, 30 years ago, um, these, I was introduced to this insertion of shunts through training. And through my career, we moved from the horrible Charles Rodick shunt to Harrison Cook shunt. They don't stay in C2 where you want them to stay. And postnatally, I've had a child, I was lucky, where I where I could do it. The shunt was in the suprapubic area. I did the MCUG through that shunt. But I agree with you, it is an exception rather than rule. But I would like to draw uh, the audience attention to the Somatex shunt, which is from Germany. And they've presented the use of Somatex in megacystis. And they claim very good results. And their very important points are the cannula is small. So the hole in the fetal bladder is small. So displacement is less. So I don't have the experience, but maybe that's the way forward. Thank okay. you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And please stop sharing the screen. And uh, thank you for these fabulous presentations and an excellent discussions. And we move to the next segment that is on urolithiasis. Uh, and the first speaker is uh, from the Turkey team. Uh, that is, uh, uh, presenter is uh, Dr. Sarkan Dogan. And uh, co present means, uh, will be discussed by this other table. So please share your screen, uh, Dr. Uh, Dogan. He's speaking on the limitations and the <clears throat> concerns regarding the RIRS in pediatric age group patients. Is that okay? Yes, perfect. Perfect. You can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, dear chairman and colleagues, uh, today the aim of my presentation is to summarize the pediatric retrograde internal surgery literature and uh, to try to define the best patient group in those uh, the optimal outcomes can be achieved. As you all know, the contemporary choice of treatment for pediatric urolithiasis is the minimally invasive methods except a very small number of patients with severe orthopedic and congenital urological abnormalities. 
Um, retrograde internal surgery is becoming more popular and has taken its place uh, in the guidelines. And as you all know, for flexible ureteroscopy, the instrument park should be complete with appropriate size instruments. The technique is similar as in adults. The need for orifice dilatation, use of access sheet, uh, timing of stenting, all depends on the surgery. Well, I think again, uh, probably there is a problem with the connectivity. Yeah. So Dr. Dogan, you have a pres uh, problem? Do you have a problem? Yes. So before he, we, we, we try again, we can move to the second presentation in this segment. is by Dr. Kavan Takwani, and he's presenting on uh, his experience, his institute experience on the uh, PCNL in pediatric age group of patients. He's mentored by the Dr. Shabnis, uh, our past president of Urological Society of India, Dr. Shabnis. Kavan? You share your screen without spoiling time. And by that time, uh, Dr. Dogan will be available mm -hmm. to present. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Audio. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, is my yeah, presentation. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, it is seen. Go ahead. Yeah, so we are uh, presenting uh, the pediatric uh, nephrolithiasis management uh, with the help of percutaneous nephrolithotomy, the long long term experience of tertiary care center in India. I am Dr. Kavar, a resident in Muljibai Pati Urological Hospital, and my mentor is Dr. R. B. Sabnes. Dr. Sabnes, so, you mute right now, please. So to start with, uh, the first reported case series of pediatric PCNL was, was by Dr. Woodside in 1985. And the pediatric PCNLs are different from the adult PCNL in the way that the large instruments are used in the smaller size kidneys. There are chances of parent camel damage and effects on the renal function in the long term. Also, there are chances of radiation exposure with, uh, due to the fluoroscopy. The risk of major complications such as sepsis, bleeding and injury to the adjacent organs. The EAU, ESPO guidelines and AUI guidelines both suggest the role of PCNL as the first choice procedure in cases of stones which are more than 2 cm in size, uh, while in the 10 to 20, 20 uh, mm size stones, the lower pole stones are first choice is PCNL and in the elderly children and in the uh, other stones, uh, the procedure of choice can be between ESWL, PCNL or RIRS. So now we, are, we will go through step by step the process of the PCNL. First, preoperative planning, we start with the ultrasound, uh, which we do in the OPD basis, uh, which is very sensitive for the diagnosis of the stones. And when we are planning for the operative intervention, what we prefer is a low-dose helical CT, which is the gold standard currently. And the the exposure is less than 0.3, uh, less than 3.5 seawards. Uh, and uh, CT IVP is reserved for the cases in which anatomical abnormalities are present. The principle as low as possible radiation. Also, we get the uh, procedure. And if the patient has an infection, we treat, uh, use we are used to treat with uh, the broad spectrum antibiotics. Use of stone scoring systems or nomograms such as stone score or SK score uh, is common, but uh, we we don't use it as a routine protocol. The intraoperative preparations usually it is done under general anesthesia and with the pediatric uh, pediatric scope we put in a five French open ended ureteric catheter and turn the patient prone. Uh, with the torso 30 degree elevated with the use of two soft bolsters or towel rolls put uh, below the chest and the lower abdomen. And for preventing the hypothermia, the usual use of warmers and warm irrigation fluids. Uh, for the puncture, the choice of our institute is the ultrasound guided puncture. Uh, there are many advantages such as avoidance of the radiation, localization of the uh, radio opaque calculi. Uh, we can puncture the posterior calyx very easily with the help of shortest straight tract. 
and also there is avoidance of visceral injuries and reduce the chance of bleeding and uh, also the exposure to the fluoroscope is reduced which is one of the main point of using the ultrasound and we usually use the puncture attachment which we can see in the image to help us in the guidance of the puncture uh, for track dilatation we we can use the single step dilator or facial dilators or implants uh, dilators which are associated with uh, less amount of bleeding and now the as the miniaturization of the instruments are there uh, we usually use the uh, the mini perk or uh, super mini pcnl ultra mini pcnl or we can use the mib xs or s which is minimal invasive percutaneous electrocytotomy uh, scopes these scopes are usually uh, ranging from the size of uh, 7.5 french to 12 french or 14 french and the sheets are in diameter of 15 uh, or 18 which is the outer sheet diameter and in case of mip the sheet can be 11 french outer diameter sheet the advantages of course are smaller scale incision single step dilatation which again prevents the radiation exposure and uh, ease of sheath placement also good working access for the pediatric instruments variable length and angles can be uh, achieved and to compare stone clearance rates are equivalent to the standard PCNL, uh, but associated with lesser blood loss and post operative complications however the studies report a longer operative time with the help of miniaturization of the instruments uh, as now multiple studies have concluded size of track does not affect the renal function or gfr but multiple tracks or multiple stages can affect the renal function in the long term uh, the use of energy source can be nowadays with miniaturization lasers uh, it can be holmium or yag laser or thulium laser the laser settings can be as low as possible uh, like ranging from 0.8 to 2 joules and between 5 to 10 frequencies uh, also we can use the trilogy by ems or the shock pulse by the uh, olympus which also gives us uh, the uh, advantage of suction along with the ultrasound and pneumatic uh, energies the exit strategy is usually uh, if it is entirely uneventful and there are no doubts of any uh, residual fragments then tubeless which is the preferred choice in our institute right now we just put in a ureteric catheter and then we remove it after post op day 2 uh, in case of residual fragment or presence of edema uh, digestant can be put integrate placement is easy and if uh, there are chances of calicell perforation or bleeding or eventful surgery long long duration surgery then 8 or 10 french uh, nelaton catheter can be used as a nephrostomy tube uh, post-operatively x-ray KOB uh -huh, is the routine minute. choice and uh, they, uh, they are uh, removed if the, uh, the procedure is uneventful and there are no fragments. Here we can see the placement of ureteric catheter. This is the ultrasound guided, guided puncture. This is the RGP. To confirm the puncture, track dilatation. And we can visualize the stone and lace it easily. And we have assessed total 786 unit in 25 years. The average stone size was 22 and there were bilateral stones in 149 patients. Uh, we did single track uh, surgery in almost 590 patients and single stage surgery in almost 600 plus patients. Uh, three, two or three stages were required in only 70 odd patients. Uh, the tubes were put nephrostomy in 97% of cases and digestant in 46% of cases. And the complication includes fever, which is 13%, which is standardized with the rates of multiple papers. But there are reported cases of non-urinary uh, non tract associated fevers also. The hemoglobin drop is in the range of 1 to 2 and transfusion rate is 4.2 percentage. The stone-free rate at one month is 98.6 percentage and the auxiliary procedures were needed in 32 patients with mean stay of 3 to 14 days and mean operative time of around 40 to 50 minutes. Uh, this is the study. Uh, the maximum limit of dilatation was 22 and stone free rate as noted was 98.6 and transfusion rate was 4.2 which is considerably better than other studies. So to summarize the technical points are use the use of the miniaturization of the instruments like mini perk or MIP. Uh, the ultrasound guided puncture is the best way to go ahead with minimal use of fluoroscopy for dilatation. The maximum track dilatation up to 22 French but uh, smaller the size the better it is and restricting the nephroscopy time to maximum 60 minutes and stage procedure when appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Kavan, for your presentation. Uh, stop sharing your screen and uh, we request Dr. Rogan if uh, his presentation is ready to share, uh, you can go ahead with the presentation. Yeah, Sarkar, would you like to try again?
you start from the where you was you can unmute you unmute yourself uh, uh, central office please uh, help me yeah so you share your screen okay my voice is coming do you hear me sir yeah yeah perfectly please share okay. your screen uh, okay sorry for the inconvenience um and i uh, hope there are uh, so many questions so please raise your thumb uh, if uh, someone's having a specific question. Otherwise, I would like to request Dr. Ansari to lead these questions. Uh, yeah, please go may ahead. I continue, sir? Yes, yes, okay. please go ahead, thank you. Okay, uh, the first pediatric flexible uteroscopy series was reported by Singh in 2006, and then up to today, many reports, even systematic reviews, meta-analysis have been published. Uh, that I will present you uh, during the remaining part of my talk. The success rates uh, has a wide range depending on the size, location, postoperative follow-up, and number of sessions. Uh, but maybe the most important factor of uh, factor is the definition of success. The flexible ureteroscopy is not without complications, uh, but thanks God, complications are mostly transient and self-limiting. Uh, this slide and the next slide, uh, these two slides. Uh, shows that the comparative studies revealed PCNL seems mostly superior in terms of single session stone free rates and overall efficacy quotient and cost and retrograde internal surgery seems advantageous in terms of fluoroscopy time, operative time, post-supportive hospital stay and uh, complication rates. And uh, a recent study showed that uh, the high power laser in retrograde internal surgery is superior uh, than low power uh, laser with shorter operative time, higher uh, single session stone free rates, uh, and with similar complication rates. The systematic reviews and meta analysis show that the advantages of PCNL becomes more evident uh, for larger stones. The most recent summary of meta-analysis, systematic reviews, and randomized control studies on the etiology, diagnostics, medical, and surgical management uh, revealed that the stu these studies mostly have low to very low grade quality. As a result of all these studies, retrograde internal surgery in children stands between PCNL and shockwave lithotripsy. There are some controversial topics to be noted and uh, contrary to initial semi-rigid ureteroscopy series, today active dilatation is not recommended. Uh, two studies are questioning our liberal double J stent usage policies. One recent study stated that younger patients needed pre-stenting more, postoperative UTI and hematuria was observed more in pre-stented patients. One study, another study, showed that two weeks of pre-stenting is better than longer period in terms of postoperative UTI and need for postoperative stenting. Complications were observed more in younger patients, uh, and stone-free rates depends on the stone size and lower calyxial localization. Stone-free rates was less for stones in lower calyx and with high Hansfield unit stones. Complications occurred more in younger patients and lower calyxial stones, and use of ureter access sheet uh, has no significant effect on stone-free rates. As we summarize all the above, above mentioned literature data, we see that PCNL, PCNL has better single session stone-free rates, better efficacy quotient, it's cheaper, it's better for uh, larger stones, and it has lesser deviation from plant surgery and better for lower calyxial stones. And as you know, all know, we have different caliber instruments available in uh, for PCNL in pediatric age group. On the other hand, the retrograde internal surgery has less uh, fluoroscopy and operative time, uh, shorter postoperative hospital stay, and low complication rates. And we know that better results with high power laser. From all these studies, we understand that the young age group large stone size, lower calyx location, high Hansfield unit are limiting factors for pediatric flexible ureteroscopy. The need for anesthesia for every intervention decreases the efficacy quotient of the surgery. 
We should keep in mind that children are more prone to infectious complications and ureteric injury. We experience that the use of ureteral access sheet is not possible in every case, taking us far away from the advantages of access sheet. And also, we should revisit our double J stand usage policy. The ideal case in order to benefit from such a good minimally invasive treatment modality, as the clinicians, we should make logical clinical decisions to achieve optimum outcomes with high stone free rate, low complication rate, short operative and fluoroscopy time, and high efficacy quotient. We see that retrograde in children, retrograde internal surgery in children uh, works best for children older than five years with small to moderate size in, uh, stones located in non-lower pole calyxes with low Hansfield unit. Operative time should be as short as possible. Fluoroscopy use should adhere to ALARA principles. Routine presenting will not be a strict policy, and if needed, duration should be as short as two weeks. Ureter access sheet usage, although does not have effect on stone-free rates, can be significant in terms of increasing the lifespan of the instrument and decreasing the intrapelvic pressure. Number of anesthetic sessions can be decreased by using double J stent with a string extinct from the urethra in uncomplicated cases. This is our institutional experience for uh, five years. We have 46 cases. We have about 60% uh, stone free rate. And as you see, we are not, we were not able to engage to the ureter at first attempt in 40% of cases. Ureter access sheet could be used only in one third of patients at first session. And in the second attempt, again, one third of patients, we have been able to use ureter access sheet. Uh, stone free rates uh, was better in patients who underwent surgery uh, with 4.9 French tip uh, flexible uteroscopy, lower uh, Hansfield unit, and without ureter access sheet. Uh, as a last slide, uh, with our significant pediatric stone disease experience, we developed a general algorithm for the use of retrograde internal surgery in children. For small size stones, single, at any location, no previous intervention, and non stin stones with all AIDS, uh, we can use shockwave lithotripsy in first step uh, with no preoperative uh, non contrast CT. For larger stones, we should proceed with PCNL with appropriate size instruments. Uh, uh, with low dose preoperative non contrast CT. And the stones with moderate sizes, if the stone is single, non lower pole location, no previous intervention, and non cysteine, you can uh, again proceed with shockwave lithotripsy in first step. For lower pole stones, we should have low dose preop CT uh, in order to evaluate the Hansfield unit and arbitrarily calculating the uh, infundibular pelvic angle. If it is larger than 45 degrees, maybe we can use shockwave lithotripsy. With higher Hansfield unit density and or uh, with inf uh, infundibular pelvic angle narrower narrow, narrow than 45 degrees, we can proceed with retrograde internal surgery or PCNL. Uh, to make the final decision intraoperatively, we perform low pressure retrograde pyelography uh, in order to assess the upper tract and we visualize the orifice. If the angle is narrow, we proceed with PCNL with appropriate size instruments. If the angle is good and the ureter calibration is good, we can proceed with retrograde internal surgery. If the angle is wide, but if the child is young or with a narrow ureter, we can uh, perform press standing and then we can attempt for retrograde internal surgery or all these uh, fails we can proceed with PCNL. Uh, thank you very much. To finish, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, and quickly, we move on to the discussion. We have a complete 10 minutes. And uh, stop sharing the screen. And I have a question first uh, to Dr. Shabnis and second to Dr. Dogan. That Dr. Shabnis, uh, uh, is it uh, the sonography machine and the prop which masterize you in sonography guided puncture, or it is a skill which you have achieved over a time? And what is the what is the uh, exactly the how exactly we can pick up the skill of sonographic guided puncture? Yeah, thank you very much. It is the uh, it is both which is important because there's no point in having only skill, but you don't have a proper probe. And if you have an extremely high fi machine, but if you are not trained, there is no point. So it is both which are complementary. And for ultrasound guided puncture and for doing basic ultrasound, uh, it doesn't require much learning curve. 
it takes only 15 days uh, you have to get trained yourself of doing ultrasound and what is important is that puncture attachment quite often i have seen people discussing that without using puncture attachment just put a probe and try to put it i think it is it is slightly better than the blind puncture so puncture attachment is important then what happens is that uh, you have to just make that electronic line onto the desired calyx and then you don't have to do anything. You just thrust the needle and that's it. So it becomes extremely simple. So puncture attachment is very important and learning curve is not much. So other than the radiation, I think the sonography gives you a much better puncture in compared to the uh, fluoroscopic. Areas. Yes, radiation is only one factor, but there are many other factors which are very, very helpful when it is ultrasound guided puncture. You can actually see the precise calyx. You can go from the periphery of the calyx, which is very important in the pediatric age group, especially if it is a horseshoe kidney, if it is a malrotated kidney, which happens in pediatric age group. If you have to avoid the pleura, if you have to avoid other organs, which are very crowded in the pediatric age group. And pediatric, what I mean is that two years, three years, I'm not talking of a 10 years and 11 years old child. But if, when it comes to two years and three years and one year old child, all these things, even the slightest amount of deviation from the normal may, will make a huge difference in the outcome and in, uh, in the incidence of complications. So I feel ultrasound guided in a pediatric age group is extremely important to avoid many, many problems and complications. Radiation avoidance is one of them. Yeah, Dr. Dogan, how far the urethra was of your concern rather than uh, along with the ureter? See, in the key, uh, it is not the only ure ureter is a limitation, but the urethral caliber is also of a limitation because uh, the smallest seat, excess seat is a 9.5 French. And we all know till the toddler, toddler toddler's age, we don't achieve that uh, kind of uh, natural diameter of the urethra. Actually, theoretically, you are right about your concerns on urethra, but uh, in our daily practice, we didn't, uh, we never experienced problems about urethral structure or other problems about urethra. For, for example, if you have a patient of two years of age, will you still, yeah. um, is, will you hesitate to go through the urethra so long uh, to reach to the uh, kidney, either with the excess seat or with the, as you said that one third time only you can put the excess seat, right? Uh, specifically, yeah. it will be yeah. more commonly in the uh, toddlers or less than the toddlers. Uh, we also have problems uh, about the uh, ureteral and uretra calibrations and uh, there's a good study from India, I think. Uh, only 10% of children less than two years old, they have been able to use uh, ureteral access sheet. Yeah. And uh, I think if you are not able to use in the ureter, it means that you will not be able to use in the ureter again. Okay? Therefore, I think practically, if you are not able to use ureteric uh, sheet, it means that you will not traumatize the urethra. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I just make one comment, Dr. Kortakani? Yes, sir. sir See, please. What, what happens is that in the RIRS, in a small children, uh, urethra becomes a big problem in the male urethra. In a female, you can still manage to put in the uh, uh, ureteroscope or smaller access sheet. And smallest, as you rightly said, that it is 9.8 access sheet. And to put in a three years, four years old child, we are not talking of a 10 years old child, where you can definitely manage do two stages and things like that. Then it becomes very critical. And mind you that uh, uh, unlike adult, if there is any problem in the urethra or in the ureter, consider that it's a lifelong problem if it is a ureteral problem. And if it is a ureteral problem, uh, that kidney is eventually go, going to go away. And therefore, in our situation, in our socioeconomic condition, even if it is a smaller stone, we would certainly prefer the uh, PCNL, especially the MIPS and MIP access, which is far, far better as compared to RIRS in, a, in a, that age group patients. I think uh, I Dr. Dogan is agree with your comments. Yeah. I completely agree with your comment. And if we feel any hesitancy about the entrance of the uh, instrument to the ureter, we shift, we shift to uh, upper approach, PCNL. Correct. And, but Correct. in Correct. the literature, when you read the literature, uh, there is studies who they perform very good uh, series uh, for children less than 18 kilograms, 20 kilograms. And 
they say that they have been able to uh, perform retrograde internal surgery even in these very small children. But my daily practice is not like that. Okay. Okay. So we have a, a question from the Dr. Paul. Yeah, quickly, sir. Uh, Dr. Dogan, I truly enjoyed your talk. I've got a practical question. You're using 4.7 urea scopes. Those are very fragile scopes and tend to break quite frequently, mm -hmm. usually after mm -hmm. a handful of uses. Um, have you had the experience with a disposable urea scope? And do you think that's a more cost effective way of doing these types of procedures rather than using a, a, the regular mm -hmm. flexible scopes? The, the, the tip of this instrument is 4.9, uh, but the, it's only the just the tip. It has an olive tip, olive like tip, and uh, the shaft is uh, enlarging to the seven French. I mean, it just eases the entrance to the ureter. Uh, the, but your I, other question, I, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't use, uh, I never used disposable uh, retrograde uh, flexible ureteroscopes uh, in small children, mm -hmm. sir. Prashant, go ahead with the question. Uh, Anil, my only query is nobody is talking of ESWL in small kids because the cases that these kids have are stones are not very big stones, a stone which can be managed by RIRS in a kid can be easily managed by ESWL. Why are we not talking about ESWL? No, I will answer that. I will answer if you if you permit. Yeah, Dr. Stavnis, yeah. Yeah, because ESWL definitely is a better option in a, if it is a smaller stones, pelvic stones, and uh, kidney is a little bit dilated, no doubt about it. But majority of the stones, when they present, they are bigger one, they are harder one, and there the problem starts. Because then you have to give uh, multiple sessions, every, every session requires anesthesia. But in a properly indicated cases, ESWL is still ideal. Another problem is that now, since the indications of overall ESWL has gone down, majority of the centers who are treating urolithiasis, they don't have machine. And if you have a pediatric uh, population, and if you have in a year, if you have very few the, uh, uh, patients who are actually indicated for ESWL, well, then you have no option but to refer those patients to a center where it is there, because there's no point in having machine, which is not viable from the economic point of view. So that is another option, another problem which uh, we face. And therefore, if you master this uh, MIP access system, it becomes quite easy even if it is a, a 7 mm, 8 mm stone in the pelvis with relatively dilated, dilated system. It is as uh, less morbid as ESWL. Okay, perfect. Last comment from Dr. Professor Tegul. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think the point that is raised by Prashant and already very well expressed by Dr. Doan is that we need to take ESWL into consideration, especially for those stones that are smaller than 10 millimeters. And actually, RIRS is competing with ESWL as a modality or intervention, not with PCNL. Any stone that is above the size of 10 millimeter, most of the time we prefer to use the PCNL. But for the ones that are smaller, ESWL is also very efficient if you have the proper machine and the infrastructure. But the retrograde internal surgery is mainly for those who, have, who are, which the stones that are harder or with higher Hansfield units, because in those stones, ESWL will not be as effective as the retrograde internal surgery. And also for those lower pole stones, uh, where you can approach the stone with your uh, scope and do the laser uh, fragmentation. Perfect. Thank you. So I think there is a uh, fabulous presentations and equally excellent discussions. Uh, and we move to the coaching. And we have uh, who can be better than the Paul Mergren to coach us. Right. Uh, so uh, there is a presentation from his team from the Seattle Children Hospital uh, USA. That is pediatric urological coaching. It's a very masterly lecture, and uh, uh, this fellow is going to speak on this. Yeah, go ahead, please. Hi, did the slides look okay? <laughs> yeah, perfect. Go ahead. All right, great. Yeah, you um, have seven minutes, and then it will be followed by a couple of minutes with discussions. Yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, thanks again. I'm Haley Silveri. I'm the current second year fellow at Seattle Children's. So we'll shift gears a little bit, discuss something a little bit less clinical, 
um, but equally as important. So um, although the development of the surgical coaching model and evaluation of its impact has been my primary research project and fellowship, this has been a true team effort. Um, and so I'd like to thank our entire work group, um, particularly Dr. Paul Margarian for his vision. So this morning we'll provide a brief an introduction to surgical coaching and then discuss um, briefly our experience at Seattle Children's. So just a few disclosures. So the work um, discussed here has been supported by the Intuitive Foundation, Foundation uh, with the Training in Human Performance Research Grant. And then all educational materials, they're marked as such, are the property of the Academy of Surgical Coaching. Um, this is the academy that um, Dr. Margarian and I received our formal training in surgical coaching. The goals of the academy are to both train, recruit um, coaches, as well as help with program design for institutions interested in establishing surgical coaching. Objectives for today. So we'll review some key concepts of coaching, briefly discuss our mo model at Seattle Children's, and discuss our experience and review some early results. So first, what is surgical coaching? Let's take a step back, what is coaching? So coaching is simply put, a method of achieving set goals. Where, has, um, where is coaching thought to originate? So it's thought to originate from the ancient schools of philosophy, where knowledge was not transferred, yet the teacher asked leading questions of the student so that the student would come to know the answer themselves. So the best definition of surgical coaching that I found from the academy is that coaching emphasizes the development and refinement of a surgeon's existing skills and empowers that individual to make improvements to their own practice. So shown here are a couple of the you know, most famous American coaches. Um, and we all you know, widely accept that coaches are necessary for high-performing athletes. And these coaches bring out the best in their athletes, not only in technical performance, but in other aspects of their life as well. So why might a coach in surgery be even more important or necessary than a coach for our most elite athletes? One reason, surgeons spend more time performing and a lot less time practicing compared to these athletes. And we're a much higher risk profession with lives at stake, whereas the athletes maybe just money is at stake. So why is this important? So surgeon skill has been shown to affect patient outcomes. So we are key players to improving outcomes in our patients. And coaching has been shown to improve both a surgeon's technical and non-technical skills. Other findings of studies are that um, coaching has helped surgeons improve their ability to self-assess, uh, their ability to communicate and lead, and potential for reduction in surgeon burnout. Although not yet shown in studies, you might think with all of these improvements, we, this could potentially lead to improvement in patient outcomes. So that's our real why here. Specific to pediatric urology, we care for patients with rare congenital anom anomalies. Some of these come around maybe once every couple of years. And then we also have steep learning curves to many of these complex cases. So you might be wondering, well, what's the difference between coaching? We, you know, we already are teachers and mentors. So the big difference with coaching is that there's no power differential between coach and coachee. Whereas with teaching and mentoring, there's, there's that power differential there. And then with the techniques involved, coaching is all about asking questions. So a coach can essentially lead an entire conversation with their coachee by just asking questions. Whereas a teacher more likely is providing, you know, directive instruction or asking um, direct questions of their learner or a mentor spends time discussing their own experience so that their mentee can take away maybe some learning points. So is there a best way to um, do surgical coaching? So the most widely accepted framework is the Wisconsin framework. It's a cycle of goal setting followed by guided inquiry. So this is where the coach is asking questions of their coachee, providing constructive feedback, followed by action planning. Now, I already mentioned, this is not just for technical skills. So coaching covers these four focuses or pillars for surgical assessment, technical skill, cognitive skill, interpersonal skills, as well as a surgeon's ability to self-regulate. 
So we'll move on to our second objective. We'll discuss our coaching model at Seattle Children's. So again, we, we adopted this model from the Wisconsin Surgical Coaching Framework. It's non-hierarchical relationship between a coach and coachee, and this is a longitudinal relationship, so over time. In our model, we have two arms. We have open cases and robotic cases, and essentially our coaches and coachees are split based on their interest in different types of surgeries, and we do have coachees that uh, cover both arms. So brief kind of picture of our model. Um, we start, each case that's included in the model starts with pre-op goal setting. So the coachee would complete this goal setting form. It's both a tool for data collection for the research uh, study, but it, it's also a tool for coaching and allows that surgeon to set goals for that case. We provide real-time coaching during which the coach takes notes to discuss later. And then after the case, we've asked our trainees and our OR staff that are involved in the case to complete evaluation forms um, so that we really have a good understanding of the perception of others and not just the surgeons in the room. After the case, the coach and coachee will debrief on the case and both will complete a debrief form. Again, it's a data collection tool, but also a coaching tool. And last, they'll come up with an action plan to help that surgeon achieve their goals. We de um, designed this study so that we can assess the model quarterly, which has allowed us to make positive changes in the model over time, but it's also allowed time for individual improvement um, after each quarter of the surgeons and coaches. Okay, and our last objective. So briefly, we don't have much time. We'll just discuss our experience, some early results. So we'll just discuss our robotic arm. So we have two coaches and one coach in the robotic arm. We've completed 25 cases within the model within the first two quarters, so the first six months. This is a breakdown of the cases included within the model for those first two quarters. So we found that surgeon goals vary. So for quarter one, the surgeon goal prioritization varied between surgeries. However, both surgeons tended to prioritize cognitive, over technical, interpersonal, and last self-regulation. And then moving into quarter two, we saw that these goals varied both between surgeries and surgeons, whereas surgeon one really prioritized self-regulation, and then surgeon two wanted to kind of refocus back on technical skills. With that, we found that subjective goal achievement is high among both surgeons for both quarters. So you can kind of see the breakdown here between surgeons for quarter one and quarter two. You'll see that a surgeon's self-assessment is different, right? So surgeon one may rate, you know, a little bit of lesser goal achievement uh, than surgeon two. One thing that's of note, the blue bar represents technical uh, goal achievement, and it's a little bit lower across the board, um, which I think we're more prone to uh, be hard on ourselves for our technical abilities. And then we found that surgeons' non-technical skills can improve over time. So we use the NOTS assessment to uh, evaluate this. Okay, so with that, we've covered our objectives for the day. In conclusion, early data suggests potential for a surgeon performance enhancement and goal achievement with initiation of a surgical coaching model. These are our references, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, and there is a question from uh, PJ to, I think, Dr. Paul. PJ, go ahead with your question. Thank you very much, Anil. Thank you, Haile and Paul, for bringing this topic. I think it's a very important one, and we have been working on the same issues in Chile. Um, just having in mind that good players less, like Nadal has a coach, why a good surgeon couldn't have a coach. So I have two, two practical questions. Um, we are um, struggling with the time. Um, the model that you present there, it's a nice model. We probably got more or less to the same model. And then we realized that we couldn't find the time to do the model, either from the coaches or the coaches. And then we try to develop some kind of um, um, taping, recording surgery and do some kind of feedback later on. Um, not really good on that. We have um, technical issues, but probably we can work together on that. And here comes the second question is, how do you find the coaches? Where? Because everybody at the beginning said, yes, I'm happy to be a coach, it's an honor. But when you came to the practical issues, uh, then there's no coach, no time. 
Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Cool. And we've had some of those same challenges here. Um, so for the, the limitation of time, uh, we found that the kind of the forms that we've created have really helped kind of cut down on the amount of time needed. So it really allows for efficient goal setting. Um, and then we also encountered the same problem. So within uh, between quarter one and quarter two, we added a separate arm to the robotic study to include cases where the coach was not able to be present. And similar to what you were doing, we're using video review for the debrief for those cases. So in our research study, we'll hopefully have results of you know, the value of coaching with the coach present versus the coach not present. Uh, but it does take work um, and it takes time to you know, both download those videos, edit those videos, and make sure that the video footage is available uh, to the team. So hopefully with further product development, that will be easier for all of us. Um, but we've, we've had those same challenges for our coaches. So we um, were fortunate in that we had two surgeons on the open side that were very interested in becoming coaches and kind of naturally suited to become coaches. And so they had a little bit of time carved out in their schedule to allow for this. Um, whereas on the robotic side, we had a surgeon that was previously working here and now he's more of like a contracted employee to really only serve as coach. And we recognize that um, we're fortunate to have that, but not every institution will have that capability. And so we're really hoping to gather data to make um, this model itself more adaptable because we understand that not every institution will have the same resources that we do. So hopefully with the other learning points that we um, take away, that can help other institutions as well. I think, I think, I think yeah, the important- I'm coming, to, coming back to you. Before that, we take quest, one question from the Dr. Ansari and then you answer for all these things. Yeah, Dr. Yes. Ansari, go ahead. Yes, and, uh, this was an excellent uh, model regarding the coaching uh, of uh, the aspirants in pediatric urology. But uh, that is uh, uh, only possible in ideal situations and the circumstances. Many of the developing countries, they are facing problem where the coaches themselves have not been coached, where the mentors themselves have not been mentored. So what is the message for them? Yeah, absolutely. Training of the coach is is key. And that's where every coaching model um, or any coaching intervention should start. Um, things can go <laughs> awry if you have a coach that hasn't been trained uh, in the principles of coaching. And so um, we've used the Academy for Surgical Coaching. They were great to work with and we learned so much. Um, we initially started this without that training. And um, after the training realized, oh, wow, <laughs> we we learned so much we were not doing coaching. So highly, highly recommend that training the coach comes first. I think I think one of the one, one of the important things here is commitments, really having commitment to coaching and having people who are committed to that. Um, uh, Haley has done a superb job in creating red cap surveys that she sends to everyone on a regular basis, she actually has a PowerPoint presentation every or a PowerPoint slide every week that she sends as a coaches um, and and reminds people the the cases for coaching for that week, um, and then also follow up. I think it's really important to actually have a have a debrief, and that's a problem that we've had this time. Time to debrief, time to go over if you are going to go over videos, but I think we really need to make a commitment. In pediatric urology, most places that do major reconstruction, they usually have two surgeons involved anyways. And so um, the commitment of people may not be an issue, um, especially for the difficult cases, such as bladder exophy closures, the major reconstructions. Yeah, I think Professor Tegbul is having some point. Well, <clears throat> my comment has already been made by Dr. Ansari, actually. Uh, I mean, the question is, how can you be a good coach? And that needs training, of course. And uh, the key is maybe, do you have to be a very good surgeon, experienced surgeon, to be a good coach? Or you can be trained, you can be a standard surgeon, knows the basics, uh, and be trained for being a coach and still be a good coach. Because pediatric urology is a little bit different than many other surgeries experience counts so much because we, we work with not protocols, 
we work with patients. It's hard to define a single entity as a disease, but more we like to define patients. Every patient is different than the other. It's not like in oncology. So where does the experience role in this coaching models? Well, I think I think um, you I, I think the most important thing I think you need to the, the coach does not need to be from a special from the same specialty. And an example is the Cleveland Clinic. I think is now assigning coaches to every surgeon. And you can have a gynecologist coaching a general surgeon, um, and it not does not need to be someone with experience. They just need to to watch and ask questions. I, th I would ask you to read, if you haven't, Atul Gawande's article in New Yorker. I can send that to you uh, on surgical coaching. Um, and it's really that the coach is there to ask questions, to ask directive questions, and does not need to be someone with experience. Okay, that cl okay. clarifies. Yeah, okay, okay, got it. Uh, means uh, that is their, their main role going to be played with the, your mental game rather than the physical uh, means uh, skill on of your hand is that uh, means uh, is work going to work with the how you uh, keep yourself less stressed stable and uh, positive and keeping healthy and sorry i need just just to to reinforce that from further if you see the good players and the coach probably the good players play better than the coach but they still need the coach so okay. just take an example uh tennis or individual players uh yeah. probably the coach sometimes they cannot hit the ball as well as the player itself but they still need the coach to be there and to get to the okay. top one very very interesting concept and i think uh, someone is watching you carefully and uh, talking to you and uh, you have an opportunity to improvise on that. I think uh, very interesting talk. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Paul, as well as the Ellie. And then we, we move to the uh, uh, next segment that is uh, again on the uh, side of uh, operative uh, technical things. And uh, there's a very interesting case from the German team uh, under the leadership of Margit Fis, uh, presented by presenting uh, Dr. Is Clara Peets. And, She's talking on the duplex kidney and unusual case. Very interesting case. Please go ahead. Share your screen, Clara. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Make it full screen, please. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Go ahead. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to present you this unusual case of a duplex kidney from Hamburg, Germany. And duplex kidneys have an incidence of 0.8 to 4%, and they are associated with other, other anomalies in 27%. The upper moiety is often seen with a ureteral seal or an anectopic ureter. And the lower moiety is often seen with vesicoureteral reflux. On the right, you can see the different endings of ectopic ureters in male and females. The ectopic ureter in females can clinically be um, seen with a continuous re urine loss, um, a dribbling urine loss, and you can find the diagnosis in the clinical examination. In an ultrasound, you might find already a duplex kidney, which then also can be seen on the MRI. And in the diagnosis, uh, diagnostical workup, also a um, scintigraphy should be done. In our case, a girl of seven years was first presented in 2018 to our clinic, and the mother described a vaginal secretion for at last one year. The girl had to use three to four pets per day, and this, uh, the amount of the secretion changes. In the sonography, 
a duplex kidney on the left side was seen. Then in 2018, in July, an MRI was done and there the left duplex kidney was confirmed with the suspicion of a ureta fissus. Moreover, a uterus filled with some fluid was seen and also streaky ovaries with multiple cysts. Uh, endocrinological workup was done and um, the results were normal. Then in the further investigation, a genetic assessment was done, which showed a female karyotype. Also a high resolution sonography was done, which showed normal inner genitalia. The vaginal secretion was assessed and um, the results were unspecific. There were leukocytes in the fluid. The MRI was repeated and there was still the left duplex kidney, of course, but no new, um, new aspects. Here you've got the picture of the MRI scan. Then in February 2019, the um, girl was investigated with a cystoscopy, which showed a normal trigone with one orifice on each side. The left orifice was slightly lateralized. Um, moreover, a vaginoscopy was done with the normal result and also an open exploration where uh, um, ureta with the normal caliber and the um, duplex, the fissus was seen. The child was then presented to two more clinics and the whole workup was repeated, the cystoscopy, the vaginoscopy, and they added also a colonoscopy with all normal results. The vaginal fluid investigation was still unspecific. In 2022, the girl was then referred again to our clinic and the mother told us that the vaginal secretion had continued and the girl was suffering. She did not want to go to school because of the incontinence. So in April 2022, the MRI was repeated and the uterus, vagina, bladder and urethra all were normal. No malformation could be seen, but a discrete vascular proliferation, perirectal, parailiacal, and inguinal was described. Um, yes, then um, here, the first time the suspect, um, we suspected a lymph secretion and the um, fluid was analyzed again and a high um, triglycerides were found and also a high amount of lymphocytes. In December 2022, the girl showed new symptoms. She now had a difference in leg length and also skin changes were seen. As you can see here on the pictures, these blue spots on the, on the right leg. An MRI lymph angiography was done in 2023 and there uh, malformation of the thoracic duct was found. So you can see here um, marked with the arrow, it's um, the malformation and marked with the star, a congested thoracic duct and um, dilated lumbar trunks. It was also seen on the scan a retrograde lymph flow into the kidneys and also pathologically enlarged intracutaneous lymph vessels in the right upper thigh, paravaginal, paraautocaval, and intraabdominal. And here now we had the description of a microcystic lymphatic anomaly. The final diagnosis is a central conducting lymphatic anomaly, shortly CCLA. In the meantime, the girl also showed new symptoms. She had a milky secretion on the um, medial thigh of her right leg and also um, 
um, a change of the circumference of a of a left. Uh, one minute left for you. The treatment options for the CCLA is a lymphatic drainage, local sclerotherapy, microsurgical anastomosis of the common duct, or also a systemic therapy can be done with, for example, tamitinib. We sent the girl to university and clinic in, in the university clinic in Bonn, where a DAS lymphangiography with occlusion of the retrograde running lymph vessels on the right um, was done. And yes, it was successful. Um, the girl has no secretion anymore. Thank you very much, Clara, to finish in uh, time. And for this brilliant uh, and very interesting case, uh, there will be a lot of discussions uh, following these uh, key more presentations. So next uh, is the uh, by Dr. Karthik Sridhar under the mentorship of Dr. Devesh Patia from Baba Sahib Ambedkar Hospital sir. Medical College, a typical case is of uh, ectopic ureter. Please uh, stop sharing, Clara. So, Dr. Yeah. Karthik, you share the screen. He has lined up very interesting case, uh, and you have uh, seven minutes to complete your presentation. Please share your screen, Karthik. Uh, sir, can you see my PowerPoint? No, 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 no. No, there's some problem. Just one minute, sir. We try once more, and uh, otherwise we'll move to the next presentation by. Sir, can you see it? No, again see? the same problem. Have you opened your uh, presentation? Uh, now can you see, sir? No, we are not seeing. Yes, sir, I've opened. Yes, sir, I've opened it. But you have to open it up before you share it. Stop all other. I have already opened all it, other sir, windows. And I'm... No, it's not coming. Your presentation is. You are sharing all the screen. All other windows are closed, sir. But uh, there is no presentation seen. Right. So you work on that. We move to the, uh, we give you after seven minutes, uh, right chance. So please, please be prepared. Before that, we go to the next presentation from the uh, Professor Lopez team. Uh, uh, Alan, Alejandra is presenting on uh, UUA. Are you ready to take the loop? Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead. Karthik, you stop trying now. Are you okay? I didn't. So, either the of one of you. The other person started sharing. Yeah. Karthik, you right now stop sharing. Karthik. Yeah. So one of you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Karthik is coming after okay. you. Can you see all the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, great. First of all, good evening. We are PJ and Alejandra Rios from Ezequiel Gonzalez Cortez Hospital in Chile. And we'll be talking about ureteral ureterostomy in duplex systems. To start, we have nothing to disclose except that we really like this technique. And we're going to try to show you why and invite you to take a leap into this approach. The decision to perform an upper or lower tract um, ablative or reconstruct reconstructive surgery is driven by a combination of factors. Um, the, presence, the presence of concomitant structural anomalies, the differential renal function, the child's clinical presentation, and the surgeon's expertise and comfort with the chosen approach. So um, now, should we resect or should we preserve? Let's start with some beliefs. According to early literature, um, to leave this plastic kidney pole could lead to malignancy, proteinuria, febrile UVTs, and hypertension. However, no studies have supported these statements. On the other hand, a pole resection doesn't offer any clear limit, and there could be functional loss of the healthy pole and could onset vesicoureteral reflux. So we decided to review our results regarding to what happened. In a period of 30 years, and with more than two year follow-up, we evaluated eight patients that underwent an aminophrectomy. 
presenting an 8.5 loss of renal function post-operative. Other papers in the literature have similar results. So since we're losing renal function by performing this resective surgery, do we really need to remove the non-functional pool? We started to look into UUI um, as a preservation surgery, and this technique caught our attention. Since 1989, numerous papers have been reporting the safety of performing this uh, surgery in, du sorry, in duplex systems. Acquiring more popularity in 2009 through the publication made by Juan Prieto and colleagues. Regarding the surgical technique, we perform an open inguinal approach through a transverse incision of two to three centimeters. We dissect the muscles between the uh, rectus abdominal and the inguinal ligament. The obliterated artery is identified. Um, the duplicated ureters are encountered between the external iliac vessels and the obliterated umbilical artery. A distal dissection of both ureters is performed between the peritoneal reflection and the common ureteral uh, sheath. Vessel loops are passed around the both ureters. We then place traction sutures in the upper pole ureter and then section the in an oblique way just above the common sheath. The distal stump of the upper pole ureter is ligated with an absorbable suture and the lower pole ureter is incised in its lateral border with a length equivalent to the diameter of the upper pole ureter. An endocyte anastomosis from the upper pole to the lower pole is performed using absorbable sutures or interrupters, uh, running or interrupted sutures to achieve a tension-free and a leaking-free anastomosis. In some cases, we leave a ureteral stent uh, from the upper pole ureter to the recipient uh, ureter and finally into the bladder. Currently, we are uh, running a multicentric experience from seven centers from different parts of the world, and it's in its way to publication. It's a retrospective study from 30 years that includes children with duplicated collecting systems with ectopic ureters or ureteral cell that underwent UUA. A total of 127 patients were included, mainly ectopic ureters that presented with hydronephrosis. In a mean follow-up of approximately two years, 98% of patients presented with improvement of their hydronephrosis or the resolution of symptoms. 2% of patients developed uh, uh, Clevian Diendo grade one complications. These were stents displacement that was repetitioned under fluoroscopy at bedside and a urinary leak that was managed conservatively with a Penrose drain. 5% of patients presented with a grade two complications, which were urinary tract infections that were managed uh, with oral antibiotics. And 2% of patients required a reintervention due to urinary leak. One was managed with a double J retail stent placement, and the second one requ required a redo of the anastomosis. Overall, this technique, despite the fact that it's an open surgery, offers satisfactory aesthetic outcomes with a scar that is hidden under underwear. It's performed extra peritoneally and has low morbidity, and it's a great alternative for centers that are lacking minimally invasive technology. We are aware that some concerns might come to mind of many. You could compromise the healthy pole with a UUA. Well, we reviewed especially this fact uh, and analyzed our patients that underwent UUA with DMS scan to review the uh, renal function. Of six patients that underwent UUI and that had more than two years of follow-up, we saw a difference of 1% between pre- and post-operative scans regarding renal function. Now, regarding the pool, uh, renal pool, uh, the compromised renal pool, we saw a functional loss of 8.1% of renal function. After a two-year follow-up, no obstruction, no hydronephrosis, no functional loss, or no new vesicle ureteral reflux was seen. So as for the final messages to take home about this uh, specific technique, 
We believe that UUA is a feasible surgery with high success rates. It, it has a low cost, it's easy to learn and teach, and it can be considered minimally invasive despite it being an open surgery approach since its scars are pra practically imperceptible. Last but not least, thank you all for inviting us to participate in this instance, and we'll leave you all invited to our hospital in Chile. Thank you, Aljin Rap, for this excellent and very precise presentation. We are in full agreement with you, but still there will be a lot many questions. And uh, with that, uh, again, Karthik, you can try sharing your screen quickly. Dr. Karthik. Karthik. In that case, uh, Priya, you start sharing your screen. Yes. Uh, last with the Karthik. Uh, Priya. Priya is from the yes, KM yes. Medical, uh, means uh, she is from the KM, which is a medical college, huge medical college from the Mumbai, and uh, mentored by the Supradit N. You, you mention your title because you changed the title with the permission. So, first, you start with the title. Am yes. I audible, sir? Yes, audible. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, yes. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Respected seniors, I am Dr. Priya Gupta, third year resident at K Hospital, Mumbai. I will be presenting treating a rare case of bladder rot obstruction with uretric obstruction in a case of a secondary obstructive mycorrhiza under the mentorship of Dr. Supradeep, sir. This is a case of a 12 year old male who presented with nocturnal hey. enuresis since history hey. of normal voiding between the <laughs> of incontinence. <laughs> Unmute yourself. Unmute plus Priya. Uh, am I audible, yeah. sir? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I'll pre presenting a case of a 12 year old male who presented with nocturnal uresis since birth, history of normal voiding between the episodes of incontinence, intermittency, and post void dribbling. Patient came with a creat of 5.2 with a clinically palpable bladder with ultrasound suggestive of bilateral gross hydronephrosis and hydroureter. PUC was inserted, creatinine reduced from 5.2 to 4.8. Uh, clinical examination and focal neurological examination were normal. Uh, after the PUC insertion, ultrasound was done, which showed a persistence of bilateral gross hydronephrosis and hydroureter. Decision taken to proceed with bilateral PCN insertion. After PCN insertion, creatinine came down to 2.6. This is a bilateral PCN gram done. This is on the right side. It shows an upper ureteric king on the left side of the image. And on the right side of the image, it shows a distal cutoff of the ureter with uh, contrast attention. Similarly, for the left PCN gram, it shows an upper ureteric king on the left side of the image with a distal ureteric uh, cutoff at uh, the lower ureter with uh, retention. MC was done to evaluate the bladder status and to rule out uh, any reflux and the urethra. Uh, the, here it shows the circulations and trabeculations. The urethra appears normal, then there is no ref reflux. So, uh, Urophilometry was done to look for the voiding pattern. It shows a Qmax of 15.5 and is voided 160 ml. UDS was done to look for the bladder status. Here it shows a uh, compliance poor with a high pressure low flow pattern for which patient underwent unilateral laser BNI. I would like to demonstrate uh, the procedure of a bilateral non refluxing ureteric reimplant using infant feeding tubes with a bladder augmentation union ileal segment. Here the retroperitoneum is opened on the left side. It shows an upper ureteric king, which we can easily see on the PCN gram. Here it shows an upper ureteric after the dissection. Then similarly, it is a dissection procedure distally to look for the distal ureteric segment. This is a distal ureteric narrow, narrowed segment of the left side. Uh, the ureteric tomy was done to look for the patency of the ureter and eight French feeding tube was passed proximally as well as distally. The distally feeding tube was passed and it confirmed the site of the distal uteric narrowing for which patient uh, distal uteric narrowing was confirmed. After confirming the narrowing, it was uh, dissected all around and five centimeter from the uh, VUJ, it was dissected using uh, sharp, sharp and blunt dissection and it is clamped using the mixture and it is uh, divided from the bladder. The distal uteric segment is ligated and the, the distal redundant portion is dissected and it's excised and sent for the histopathological examination. Similar uh, cystotomy was done, bladder was open on the anterior aspect for putting the ileal segment over the bladder. Now, feeding tube were passed, eight French feeding tube was passed from the right side of the abdomen 
wall and then it is brought into the abdomen then through the right posterior lateral incision into the bladder then it is passed across in a straight line towards the left side of the ureter the left the feeding tube is passed with negotiated through the king and it helps to straighten the ureters then uh, the, the mucosa mucosa to mucosa anastomosis then it is closed as like an ureteric reimplant similarly dissection proceed on the right side right side upper uh, ureteric king is identified which was seen on the pcn gram image similar the distal uh, ureteric narrowing is identified this is also ligated and divided using uh, scissors similar the distal redundant dis dissection is proceeded proximally the distal redundant segment of the ureter is uh, divided and sent for histopathological examination uh, it is spatulated and the eight french feeding tubes are passed into the prox proximally similarly the left side of the abdomen incision taken feeding tube brought inside through the left side of the abdomen into the abdominal then through the bladder here you can see the ureter which is being implanted and having a straight course similar the incision taken on the uh, left posterior lateral wall and it is brought out it brought inside the bladder here you can see the tra trabeculated bladder with circulations then proceeded for the reimplant on the right side. The right postural incision taken, retrosal muscle is open. It is dissected all around through the mucosa to isolate the mucosa. The mucosa is being mucosa is being cut. Then feeding tubes are brought from the neo hiatus. Uh, this is, then it is pushed into the or upper or proximally. And the, it is proceeded with the steps of the ureteric re-implant. Mucosal to mucosal anastomosis, the feeding tube being passed through the king after the dissecting the upper ureteric segment. This is uh, closure of the la layers of the approximation of the layers of the ureter and the detrusor muscle, uh, mucosa. This is a detrusor muscle being approximated Using Vicarin. Priya, Priya, can you move uh, to the conclusion? Yes. This is the prompts. Uh, you use a bobble segment for the augmentation. Similarly, this is after, after the final picture of ureteric reimplant. Point of technique is feeding tubes were used as they are more pliable. It has to straighten the ureters. It can be easily removed, doesn't require any admission. Augmentation helps in the creation of a low pressure reservoir, though with the need for CSIC. To conclude, many patients with chronic terminal ureteric obstruction have tortuous ureters and uh, secondary obstruction. Classical te teaching is to take care of single pathology at a time and the ureter should not be operated on in the same surgery. Here it seems to feasible to operate on both the ureters and manage the upper and the lower ureteric obstruction in the same setting, but with special emphasis on maintaining the blood supply and doing minimal dissection. The main purpose here is to preserve the renal function and prevent for need for renal replacement therapy and the risk of va various complications such as pyelonephritis and calcinia. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, stops sharing the screen and uh, I request again uh, the last speaker of this segment uh, is Dr. Karthik. Are you ready? Uh, I'll try again. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, now. No, again the same problem. Did you try uh, during this period uh, with the other Zoom uh, of your friend? Yeah. No, sir, I did not. Yeah, now it has come. Make it's it some, sir. Yeah, All I right, can sir. see the, your screen now. Make it full screen. All right, sir. Yeah, yes, sir, yeah, I made ahead. it full screen. Yeah, go All ahead. Right, sir. Uh, very good evening, respected teachers and dear friends. I shall be presenting three atypical cases of ectopic ureter. All of them have been managed with three different management strategies. I am Dr. Karthik Sedar. I am a grade 3 specialist in urology in BSA Hospital and Medical College in Rohini, New Delhi. So these are our three cases. We had an 18-year-old female with a single system ectopic ureter draining into the garter cyst with a functional kidney. A 5-year-old with a left-sided double system 
with both the upper and the lower moiety draining in the vagina. And a 10-year-old female with a single system ectopic ureter draining into the vagina, but here the kidney was non-functional. So our first patient was an 18-year-old girl who presented to us with a vaginal swelling with continuous incontinence. This is the picture with which she presented to us. Clinical evaluation showed a left-sided single system ectopic ureter draining into the gardener cyst in the vagina and there was continuous dribbling of urine. Our management was by left-sided laparoscopic ureteric reimplantation. After going through world literature, there have only been two cases prior to ours of an SSEU where there was no renal dysplasia or congenital anomaly where laparoscopic reconstructive uh, surgery was done. These are her preoperative images. We can see the hydroureteral and in this image, we can see the ureter opening in the anterior wall of the vagina. These are the paroperative images. This is her RGP film. This is uh, the ureteric catheter being inserted in the opening in the Gartner cyst. This is the ureter primary view prior to dissection. This is after the ureter was dissected. This is the anastomosis in progress and the stented progress. And this is the final picture after we have done a SOA stitch and we have done the tunnel. This is how the patient looked postoperatively. Our second patient was a five-year-old who came to us with normal voiding habits, yet she was persistently incontinent. And pelvic exam showed a duplex system. This time, both the upper and the lower moiety were draining in the vagina with continuous leakage from the introitus. So the management here was open left-sided common ureteric sheath reimplant along with tailoring of the distal ends of the ureter as the both the ureters were highly dilated. So these are their, her paroperative images. We exposed her via the Gibson's incision. These are the two dilated ureters. This is the picture after dismemberment. We separated the distal ends a little bit and we have done tailoring here over a 10 French Foley's catheter using Kaczynski's technique. And this is the final image after the anastomosis was done. The third case was a 10-year-old female who presented to us with repeated histories of UTI and imaging showed a single system ectopic ureter with the ureter draining in the vagina, but here the kidney was dysplastic and non-functional. So here what we did was a simple left-sided simple open nephrectomy. So why is our series unique? Do ectopic ureters most of the time are seen in duplex system with a ratio of 80 to 20 for duplex is to single. So SSEU is a rare entity. In addition to that, most SSEUs are associated with non-functional kidneys and most of them have congenital anomalies. In a span of one year, we got two SSEUs where there was no associated congenital anomaly and the patients were mentally normal and there was no physical abnormality with them. In addition to, as I mentioned before, this is the third case in world literature where lab reconstruction has been done in an SHCU with a Gartner cyst and uh, with the kidney being functional. In, in our uh, second case, the five-year-old child, conventionally duplex systems use the Vigart Myers rule for drainage. But here we have an upper and a lower moiety draining in the vagina. And as per world literature, we have very few limited cases which are reporting this kind of a variation. Uh, so conclusion is an ectopic ureter should be considered as a differential for incontinence in any toilet trained child. Classically, they are duplex and drained via the Vigart Myers rule, but there may be variations. And many a times these variations can be managed by laparoscopic or by open surgery. Thank you so much. This is our hospital. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Karthik, uh, for finishing it uh, very much in time. Uh, and with that, uh, we are finishing this finish these four presentations, and the floor is open for the discussion. There will be many people to discuss. Uh, those who are interested can raise them. Uh, oh, and I have an opportunity to ask, uh, Miss. I had the opportunity to agree with the PJ or you, you, but anytime you need to reoperate the patient of you, you. Uh, having uh, some leak or some kind of complication uh, and if, if it is uh, how did how far it was difficult um so far and i touch wound we haven't done that uh, no leaking yet but i guess it will be like any other leaking if you do a pyroplasty and it's leaking at the end of the day it will be all attached all with uh, tissue that has been there have you, uh, any, have you any time faced the urinum of formation as we don't keep drain most of the time because we don't create no, the space here? No, right. we haven't. If you can right. see, and hopefully the paper will come out um, soon this year, 
half of the patient has a stent, an astomotic stent, half of the patient didn't have a stent, and the results are the same. We are the group who are using the stent, but now that we see the results of our co-authors, um, maybe we don't need to use the stent. So we are in that in that kind of of the, uh, dilemma now. But we use a stent, and also we use a, a bladder catheter, a Foley catheter for three five days. So we keep the whole system really drained without a, an external drainage. Do you mobilize lower moiety ureter more, or you mobilize? upper moiety ureter more uh, to avoid the kink, a possible kink at the site of anastomosis? Pull. We we work with the uh, upper one, the dilatated one, rather than the one who will receive. So the one who is dilatated, we just mobilize them, uh, cut them if it's needed, and try to get it straight. And as Alejandra showed very well, you get the one ureter here, and the one other one come in this position. So the drainage, it seems very smooth to one to the other system. So it's very rewarding surgery in a very, very minimal invasive. Yeah, Dr. Ansari, you have a question. Unmute yourself. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Oh, I just uh, go back uh, to Dr. Clara. Is she there? Yeah, Margaret is yeah. there. Clara also. Oh, yes, Where? Dr. Margaret. This was a really an interesting case because this is extremely rare entity, and uh, this is uh, this is uh, uh, literature. It has been described as Klippel Trinanone syndrome also. And in the past, we had two sin two such cases, and uh, they are basically have nothing to do with the kidneys, but they may be just an incidental finding, or uh, yeah. these are basically lymphangiectasis along with some uh, organomegaly. And usually the lower limbs, uh, as far as the location of the lymphatic system is concerned, lower limbs are hypertrophied. And uh, no, milder case, they usually go asymptomatic, but usually the your case, who, who had a huge lymphagiectasis. And most of the time when a pediatric urologist or urologist gets such cases, is in a dilemma how to deal with such cases. And I really congratulate the way it was managed. But I may ma I mention two more specific entities for the treatment, propanolol beta blocker has also been used to reduce the, this uh, lymphedema in such cases. And some of the cases uh, where the surgical intervention it, it all not possible in these cases, radiation therapy has also been utilized in such cases. Yeah, thank you for your comments. Uh, it was a little bit tricky because it was the vaginal uh, ex -flu uh, the fluid what really misled everybody. I mean, that the yes. child was at four different institutions. And finally, I, we thought, okay, let's let's have a closer look to it. And then the, the final investigation of the fluid uh, brought us really to the right way. And what we have, and Clara has shown it on the last slide, now in Europe are the European reference networks for rare diseases. So we have 24 European reference networks now, and then we contacted VASCAN, which is the multi-systemic vascular disease network, mm -hmm. and they said, okay, this is the malformation, and then they referred the, 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 the child to Bonn and said, let's first try to do an occlusion um, using uh, uh, um lymph angiography, and if this is not working, then we could do also a systemic therapy with dramatinib or sirolimus. So, yes. but the child was happy after that uh, local treatment, so she's no longer losing fluid. <laughs> it's really and, rare. <laughs> yes, and one of the kid has basically penile overgrowth, so it was yeah. very difficult. And the boy was always shying in showing the organ. But somehow we have to refer him to the plastic reconstruction. So they have to excise and put another graph to make it shorter. Oh. Anil, can I ask one? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, this is uh, to Dr. Priya. I was just wondering uh, when we I looked at your case, uh, I was not very clear where was the outlet obstruction. That's number one. And number two, What's actually the thing which led you to do an augment? Was it the very small bladder with fibrotic bladder or is it a hyperreflexic bladder? Because augmenting a bladder is something which we would like to do it at the last. 
because it's something which we cannot bring it back and you have defunctionalized the bladder totally. So we're just a little perplexed about the whole uh, situation where you did the uh, surgery of the yeah. uh, part of augment. Was there, the... I'll answer. There was a hyper, it was a hyperreflex. It was a hyperreflex small person. capacity low co compliance bladder. Yeah, yeah you can go ahead. Thank you, sir. Yeah, for the you can also answer. Yeah, please go ahead. So actually, we did a cystoscopy, sir. It showed a high bladder neck. And on UDS, there was a poor compliance, but it was a good capacity uh, bladder. So based, because of the poor compliance, we uh, plan to go ahead with the augmentation, sir. If Just you have the UDS, future, can... uh, so it was hyperreflexic, low compliant bladder, and it had high bladder pressures of 80. So that's yes, why we did yes, a BN, and then we went uh, uh, because both the upper systems were already uh, decompensated. Uh, we thought we could subject the child to more high bladder pressures. Ma'am, there's a little uh, conflict of interest at this point is with a higher creatinine uh, in a young child. We put in a pileum. Uh, there would be significant metabolic uh, complications going through that's number one number two i think we have uh, we do have a little significant number of uh, medications of botox before we actually we tend to go ahead and then do an augment but if you're doing an augment thinking that tomorrow this child would need a transplant though because both kidneys are compromised probably that would be an indication at this point uh, Priya, you stopped yeah. sharing screen. Uh, so we did can, not uh, do see a others. Yeah, Priya, classical you sharing the screen. So, Professor Tegul wanted to make some comment. Yeah. Pardon, sir. Yeah, you, you are unmute yourself, Professor Tegul. He probably is not able to. Anyway, uh, any more question? So, ultimately, uh, yeah. Okay, ma'am, uh, Sujata, ma'am, you would like to conclude on your comment? Uh, uh, want to respond, Malika Arjun, with the concluding remarks on your case? Ma'am, your audio. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So we are not able to get the madam's uh, yes, video. Sir. This audio, right? Uh, up uh, that. Malik, uh, you don't have any more questions. If you have any question, more, Malik. Yes. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Fine. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, so. Very great case from Margit. Uh, any any more questions from for that case? Because it was a very tricky situations as duplex kidney with this leak. Uh, I think uh, misguided lot, and so many things uh, taken place mis. Uh, in a, so many places, in so many ways, a patient was treated and ultimately this condition was found out and the child improved. I think uh, any any final message, Margaret, for your case? No, I, I think it's, uh, it's important that we have now this European reference networks for these rare diseases. And I think that's the future for this, this very, very rare cases, because at any place there will be an expert who knows <laughs> what it is. And uh, I think that's, that's really a good thing. Uh, this was introduced by the European Commission and it's really great. It's a brilliant idea. Brilliant idea. I think uh, we will be also thinking and working on that. Uh, yeah, I would just like to mention, Anil, that KM yes. is, the, uh, is the center for reporting rare 
diseases and i can pass on the phone number uh, akash shukla who is in charge of it so oh, in okay. india also we have this uh, platform which can be utilized okay and it is uh, with the multi specialties all specialties are participating into that yes all specialties can participate and the funding given by the government is 5 crores per year perfect very good the good patient information. can also avail treatment the patient can also avail treatment for rare diseases so i think this is a, a good forum to pass on this information for these perfect. children who can benefit and their treatment would be covered by the government thank you thank you very much uh, so we conclude this uh, session uh, and the last session that is on the kidney and ureter and this is from the Canada. I'm not able to see Louis, but I think uh, Dr. Yakub is here. Please share your screen and he's going to speak on the very important uh, aspect of long speculation and the use of RGP to recognize the length of the segment of the obstetric segment or a dynamic segment in the phalloplasty. Yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Yaku. We are not again seeing you as well as your audio. So, Central Office, can you help me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, please. All right, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Jaf Jaf Jafar. I'm with Dr. Louis Braga, my mentor. Uh, and today we're going to speak about tips for successful pyoplasty in infant rule of retrograde pyogram and the long speculation. Okay. Okay, so before I go deep in this uh, interesting subject, I would like to present this interesting article, which is a long-term follow-up of pediatric dismembrane pyoplasty. How long is long enough? This is actually a retrospective study over a period of uh, 10 years. They included 116 patients that underwent pyoplasty, and they follow up the patients from five to 15 years. The interesting finding in this article was there was 13 patients who had pyoplasty, had residual hydronephrosis, and prolonged drainage on Mark three during the follow-up. So we're starting asking our, our sub-question, why some of the, our, our patients, they don't have a complete resolution of hydronephrosis? And uh, therefore, Dr. Braga and his team published an article at that time was in SickKid in 2008 in Journal of Urology, which is a risk factor of recurrent UPG obstructions after open pyoplasty in a large pediatric cohort. They did a retrospective, uh, retrospective study. They included 104 open pyoplasty, and their recurrence rate was 5%. They, after doing this statistical analysis, they found out there's two independent risk factors for recurrent UPG obstruction. The first one, of the patient that did not underwent RPG, which is retrograde pyogram, and the second risk factor was dorsal lumbotomies. And the rationale for the RPG was the RPG provided uh, enough anatomical information to choose the best incision for the kidney in terms of position, kidney position or malrotation. Second thing to, uh, to avoid, uh, sorry, to provide enough information to, to perform adequate length of speculation and uh, study the patency and the caliper of this aorta. And this will lead to increased chance of successful pyoplasty. So is it useful to do RPG for uh, every pyoplasty that we perform? Some surgeons, uh, they advocate against it because risk of radiations and it increased the upper time from uh, 15 to one hour. Sorry. And with, now with laparoscopic and robotic surgery, it allows good uh, visual, visualization of the entire aorta. So is it useful? And globally, pyoplasty is a successful procedure. I'm sharing with you some of the uh, causes of UPG obstruction here on the right uh, on the right side. We can see uh, UPG obstruction causing by high insertion UPG. Second, in the middle, we can see uh, the co the cause of the obstruction was fibrocytic pod at the UPG level. And the third one we can see on the left, or left, you can see it's a long intrinsic uh, obstruction. So I did, we did our future review and we found some interesting uh, articles I would like to share today with you guys. The first one is uh, this interesting article that was published in, by the Indiana Police team in 2020 in Journal of Pediatric Ecology. They did a retrospective study. They included 115 patients that underwent pyoplasty over a period of eight and a half years. 
all the patients underwent RPG prior to pyroplasty. And they found out 27 of the pyroplasty underwent alternative incision to the standard flak incision because of the uh, anatomical information that was gained by the RPG. And this is actually one of the, our uh, uh, milestone in pediatric ecology published by the, our, one of our pioneers, Dr. Han, uh, Hendren and Dr. Cockstrell, uh, that they stated that among 100 patients that underwent pyroplasty for UBG obstruction, 36 patients found to have another, other cause of obstruction besides intrinsic narrowing, such as high insertion UPG, fibroptery polyps, and upper ureter kink or crossing vessel. One of the studies this is I would like to share today with you, done published in 2014, Journal of Pediatric Urology. Does surgical approach change the need for retrograde pyogram prior to pyoplasty? This is a retrospective study. They uh, uh, done over a period of four years. 62 patients underwent RPG and uh, 38 patients not underwent RPG prior to pyoplasty. And the conclusion was there is no difference between patient underwent RPG versus patient did not underwent RPG in terms of the hospital stay, complication rate, or recurrence rate. However, they mentioned in their uh, article, 18.9% of patients underwent RPG provides additional anatomical uh, information in which it led to change of surgical approach in terms of from dorsal lumbotomy to plaque position. We can see some bias, uh, selection bias here. So, our philosophy regarding, sorry, our rationale regarding RPG, it does help delineating the extent of the return narrowing. It helps provide uh, enough uh, information to perform uh, sufficient speculation until we see the healthy ureter and provide better understanding of the anatomy. Here, this is a case of open pyroplasty. The RPG for the pyroplasty, you can see it's a long intrinsic narrowing of the UPG and the uh, upper ureter. So we were, we were prepared to dissect the ureter and, until we see the healthy part, and we performed a long speculation. Uh, one of our important tips in, uh, while performing the pyroplasty, we should identify the normal ureter. Here, I would like to share this video with you and how to perform a long speculation. Usually, some of, many of the cases you can see no, uh, uh, the neural segment can be long. And you should have confidence to go until you see a healthy part of the ureter. You should not stop before uh, before reaching a healthy part. And, uh, and it will lead you to perform a widely open funnel shape dependent anastomosis. So, for example, this is a case of long, uh, long segment intrinsic obstruction. So here, cl uh, clearly, we have to do, perform a long speculation to achieve a wide open anastomosis. Sometimes, because we do some very small incision, sometimes we may miss a part of the narrow ureter. So here, it's, a, it's a clearly uh, that the RPG is helpful to study the anatomy before proceeding with the pyroplasty. And also, it does provide. Uh, this is a uh, sorry. This is article published by Dr. Braga in 2010. They they found the concurrent UVG Last and uh, UPG obstruction. Sorry. Last minute to conclude. Okay, so they found out uh, among 100 patients that underwent pyroplasty, they have 3% they have UVG obstruction, and that would to lead to technical difficulty while insertion the WG stent. And to, to lead the leak, inability to remove the salary stent, and to prolong the hospital stay. In terms of uh, lab, uh, the laparoscopic pyroplasty, even when we see the entire, we examine the entire tear, sometimes the RPG is useful, especially in case of long intramural polyps. And this is, we, we encounter this frequently. It's not extremely rare to see these conditions. So in conclusion, RPG increased the chance of successful pyroplasty. It leads to fewer recurrence UPG obstruction. It helped the surgical planning and defining our strategy. It allowed better definition of ureteral anatomy and may help detect rare cases such as concomitant UPG or UPG obstruction. And it's even useful in case of laparoscopic cases uh, in setting of intralimular polyps. And this is a case of pre-op uh, uh, UPG obstruction. Uh, and the, uh, immediately post of ultrasound after the pyroplasty, we can see complete resolution of the uh, hydrophosis. Thank you for your time, guys. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yakub.
for this excellent presentation. Please stop sharing the screen. And yes. uh, I hope uh, Dr. Christina is there. Christina, you will join. Yeah, Christina, you can share your screen. And uh, she is mentored by the Dr. Mohan Gundeti from Chicago. And she is speaking on the robotic implant is a point of technique. Please share your screen. Hi, I'm Mohan. Yeah. Yeah, please, Christina. Hi, can you hear me? No, you have to open your, yeah. We are not seeing your screen. We are seeing the screen, but not presentation. Okay. Yeah, got yeah. it. Okay. okay, got it. Full screen, okay. please. Yes, it's loading. Thank you. Perfect. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. My name is Christina Gam. I'm a urology resident at the University of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I will be presenting with Dr. Gundetti on the topic of, of robotic extravesicle ureter implant, uh, some points of technique. Firstly, the selection criteria for robotic reimplant is the same as that for open ureteral reimplant. The indications for surgical intervention should not change because of the technology. We only operate on higher grades of VOR, specifically grades three through five, in accordance with EAU guidelines. Only toilet trained children are considered for surgery in our practice. And it is important to be aware of bowel bladder dysfunction and address this first if needed. Our technique of robotic extravesical reimplant has evolved over the years. Initially in 2008, we started with just a detrus rurafi. The success rates as defined by radiographic resolution on post-op VCUG were quite low, initially at 67%. This led to further modifications of our technique. So our second evolution um, in 2010, we developed the addition of inclusion of the ureteral adventitia into the detrusorography as our thought process was that it was possible that the ureter was able to slip out of the detrusor tunnel and was now not well incorporated into it. Once we did this, this improved the success rate from 67% to 73%, but this was still quite low. This led to our um, final technique modifications in 2011, incorporating um, and anchoring stitches proximally and distally and universal tunnel length of four centimeters. The U stitch being the most distal anchor here and the apical alignment suture here being the most proximal. And this improved our access, success rates to 87%. We named this technique the LUAA technique based on L, the length of the tunnel being four centimeters, U, the incorporation of the U stitch, A, adventitial incorporation into the detrusor tunnel, and A, the apical alignment stitch. This has roots in the historical techniques for extravesical reimplant based on Leish Gregoire's detrusor tunnel in 1961. Zayant's ureteral anchoring in 1987, as well as laparoscopic extravesical detrusoral refi techniques. Um, now I'll go into further details of how the reimplant is completed. The ports are placed as depicted in these images. We start with an open Hassan technique with the initial incision peri-umbilically. Insufflation is initiated at 12 and then reduced to 10. The camera is placed peri-umbilically with a balloon port. The robotic ports are placed laterally at the midclavicular lines. We use a monopolar scissor in the right hand and a bipolar Maryland in the left hand. And we do use an assistant port in the left upper quadrant. And the robot is placed uh, between the legs of the patient. We do not routinely use ureteral stents for the following reasons. The uh, stent takes away from the flexibility of the ureter and makes things more difficult, especially the creation of the detrusor tunnel as you may not be able to create a snug tunnel on a stiff ureter. Um, we have found that stents may not significantly reduce the chance of ureteral obstruction postoperatively. Next, I'll show some images of our technique for ureteral mobilization. For male patients, identify the ureter above the pelvic brim, as you can see in this image. Create another peritoneal window above the vas deferens. And we use umbilical tape around the ureter for traction and handling to avoid direct handling of the ureter. In females, it is a similar technique, and instead of the vas deferens, you encounter the urine, uh, uterine artery, which can be transected if needed. 
Next, I'll show some video clips of our technique after ureteral mobilization. So let me begin it here. So we spare the tissue at the um, dorsomedially at the, uh, the UVJ to try to reduce the risk of urinary retention. Once both ureters are mobilized, the bladder is distended with saline and the bladder is then hitched anteriorly with a vicral suture. The alignment of the detrusor tunnels is planned and the tunnels are incised. We score in a Y shape around the UVJ, again going widely, especially as we go medial to spare the neurovascular bundle. And again, this tunnel is measured at four centimeters. And this clip is just showing the repeat on the contralateral side. So I'll move ahead for sake of time. We then complete the distal U stitch. All suturing is completed with 4 OPDS suture. The detrusor tunnel is then completed over the ureter. We then perform the apical alignment stitch proximally. In this clip, you can see the assistant using the umbilical tape to retract the ureter. And there's that apical alignment. Christina, you have to conclude in meet. Sure. So, so postoperatively, we uh, remove the catheter on post-up day one in a uh, unilateral ring plant and post-up day two for a bilateral and discharge home after voiding. We encourage time voiding and regular bowel movements. We follow up with an ultrasound scan in one month and a BCUG in four months. If all imaging is normal, the next ultrasound is done at one year, and we discharge patients from care if the imaging is normal. Um, here are some of our data on our outcomes. Uh, we have some data up to 2018 comparing open versus robotic reimplant. Our data shows success rates continue to improve up to 91% in this data with um, 95 cases completed. And this shows our complication rates. We have a 4% risk of uh, urinary retention and uh, low rates of bladder leak and ureteral injury. Finally, I'll conclude with some tips to avoid uh, complications after robotic reimplant. To avoid ureteral angulation, create a detrusor tunnel in alignment with the ureter. To avoid urinary retention, avoid dissection at the neurovascular bundle located dorsomedial to the UVJ. And to avoid uh, ureteral complications, uh, handle the ureter with care and consider umbilical tape as a handle. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, for uh, this presentation. And Dr. Mohan also. Mohan has joined. Uh, we'll be discussing this a uh, little later. So with that, uh, we are moving to team from Italy. Uh, uh, Gleda is presenting on... Uh, kidney and urinary tract malformation in patients affected by the Hirschsprung disease and mentored by the Professor Emilio Merlin. So, uh, please share your screen. Gerda? Yeah, perfect. Make it full screen. We have a very huge number of uh, urologists is watching us on YouTube on the on the uh, the link which was provided to register. So keep going. 
Yes, get it. You cannot unmute. Uh, central office can help uh, get her to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Go ahead. Uh, good evening to all. Thank you for the opportunity to show us you uh, the um, a recent advancement on uh, kidney and urinary tract malformation in Hirschsprung disease. I'm here a resident in uh, Alessandria. And um, but first of all, a quick introduction on uh, this uh, pathology. Hirschsprung is a, a rare congenital anomaly uh, regarding the um, parasympathetic ganglion cells in the submucosal and myenteric plexuses of the enteric nervous system. Uh, it has variable proximal bowel involvement, and it is a multifactorial congenital disease with uh, uh, many predisposing genetic background as uh, uh, rat anomalies uh, um, pathways. Uh, the uh, associated abnormalities with Hirschsprung uh, comprehends uh, congenital, congenital urinary tract anomalies and kidney anomalies. Uh, it was uh, well described in literature with an average of 6% of cases uh, in uh, Hirschsprung patients. As we will see in my presentation, uh, this uh, association is much higher than uh, what uh, uh, written before in uh, literature. Uh, all of us knows uh, what's uh, uh, CACUT, the four congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract, uh, which comprehends many anomalies. The most prevalent uh, of these uh, is hydronephrosis in general population. But as we will see, in Hirschsprung patients uh, uh, is not uh, actually the most prevalent for many reasons, as I show you. Uh, they occur in the general population with uh, four to 60 person every one th uh, 100,000 uh, live births. And uh, our study uh, started from December 2005 till today. Uh, for every Hirschsprung patient histologically confirmed, uh, we um, they underwent uh, a uh, complete nephrological workup, uh, which comprehends uh, urinalysis and urine culture, and even kidney ultrasound. For whoever needed, uh, we also uh, performed the scintigraphy or voidin cystoretrography or euro MRI. Uh, our study population comprehends 376 uh, patients. 20% of them have uh, some form of uh, CACUT. Most of them uh, had uh, kidney hypoplasia, dysplasia. This may be uh, due to the fact that both the enteric nervous system and uh, CACUT and the development of the kidney actually um, have the same um, uh, RET GDNF uh, signaling pathway uh, genetic predisposition. Therefore, uh, the, uh, because uh, RET GDNF, uh, for the correct interaction of the ureteric bud and the metanephric blastema, uh, are necessary for the um, correct uh, uh, kidney development. And that's why most of our patients uh, um, with Hirschsprung disease uh, are uh, even also associated with uh, uh, some form of uh, kidney hypoplasia, dysplasia. Uh, in fact, as you can see in many studies, uh, it is written that uh, renal agenesis is particularly um, found in uh, RET and GDNF knockout mice with also Hirschsprung. Uh, our uh, patients are all screened for RET protoncogenes, and uh, this is uh, uh, since the uh, 90s. And most of them um, were ultra long forms with RET gene uh, anomalies, and are uh, 17 to 20 percent of the total of the patients taken into account. Uh, for the um, study population uh, we uh, represented in this uh, particular study, 20% um, had some form of RET um, anomalies uh, 
with only Hirschsprung, without the association to some form of uh, kidney or ure ureter uh, anomalies, while 16% have the um, direct uh, 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 predisposition with CACUT. So to conclude, uh, in respect to, to what was uh, written before, uh, the incidence of CACUT uh, uh, in uh, Hirschsprung patients is much more higher, four folds higher than uh, uh, written before in literature. And we can also speculate on the, um, uh, the role that have some genetic pathways in the uh, development of some form of congenital anomalies of the kidney and urinary tract in these patients. Therefore, uh, more studies are needed to understand uh, uh, what are the uh, specific and genetic predisposing uh, pathway uh, related to visit anomalies. Thank you all for the attention. Thank you very much, Gera and Professor Emilio, for this excellent compilation of this work. And we hope that there will be some discussion on this. Uh, with that, uh, we have a last uh, main presentation followed by the some small talk by the Professor Ansari and uh, Dr. Priyank Yadav. But first, uh, before that, uh, Dr. Kasi, you said start sharing your screen. And he's speaking on the pediatric renal transplantation, a comprehensive eight year institutional analysis from the KMC Manipal, mentored by the Professor Arun Chawla, head KMC Manipal, Neurology Department. Yeah, go ahead. Full screen, make it full screen. Yeah, go ahead. Kasi? Can someone help uh, Kasi to be audible? Sorry, sir. So, yeah, uh, good, good evening. Uh, yes, sir. Dr. Kasi Vishwanath from uh, KMC Manipal. I'll be presenting our experience with pediatric renal transplantation. So, what is different about pediatric transplant is the presence of congenital anomalies of kidney and the urinary tract, uh, which often lead to these end stage renal diseases. And also, the current bladder and voiding dynamics need to be addressed prior to uh, transplantation. These children are often malnourished and growth impaired. Though uh, many of them are initiated on dialysis, preferably pe uh, peritoneal, but peritoneal comes with its own uh, technical financial constraints and can complicate further surgeries. The role of parent or caretaker in ensuring compliance post-transplant cannot be overemphasized. Coming to specific challenges, uh, they would be vascular steel from a large graft causing hemodynamic changes, adult size kidney and vessel caliber mismatch causing surgical challenges and post-operative high chance of graft thrombosis. So our goal is to ensure normal urinary drainage uh, into a low pressure continent reservoir which allows for volitional emptying. So our protocol would be initial assessment by a multidisciplinary team of which the urological evaluation includes history, uh, routine investigations such as ultrasound, flow rate and post word residue in all patients. We reserve investigations such as VCUG, urodynamics and uterocystoscopy for specific indications such as neurogenic bladders, posterior valves, uh, voiding dysfunction, etc. Our immunosuppression protocol includes induction with uh, ATG or basiliximab and maintenance with tacrolimus, mycophenolate and prednisolone. We start to taper prednisolone after six weeks. Coming to the surgery, we prefer uh, extraperitoneal or intraperitoneal approach is decided on the patient's body habitus. The vascular anastomosis is as per anatomical configuration. For the ureter, we perform an extravesical, non-refluxing ureterovesical anastomosis. Here is a short video showing the incision. We prefer a hockey stick or an inverted J-shaped incision. Now, when we proceed to the preparation of graft bed, Often in pediatric transplants, we end up uh, utilizing the common iliac vessels or higher up, the IVC and the iota. As you can see, the artery is being dissected and we have control of the artery. Now you can see opposite common iliac vein, ipsilateral common iliac vein and the IVC. <clears throat> now we mobilize the vein and get control of the vein. Here the internal iliac was ligated. We mark the site for anastomosis. 
here we anast uh, planned for a uh, ivc anastomosis and the donor had multiple vessels so two sites on the artery so apply the clamp so, followed by a venotomy the renal vein to ivc was an end to side anastomosis which is then followed by application of the arterial clamps and arteriotomy to the common iliac artery here. The renal artery to the common iliac artery was again end to side. And here we'll be doing two anastomosis of the uh, two renal, uh, renal vessels. which is followed by release of the clamp and graft perfusion. Uh, hemodynamic monitoring, very important here. We can see that the graft turns pink and starts to pour urine, ensuring adequate perfusion of the graft. The arterial anastomosis is again visualized, the venous anastomosis. <clears throat> this is then followed by a Lisch-Gregor extravesical non-refluxing anastomosis over a four French digestant. So uh, in our eight-year retrospective analysis, we had performed 14 pediatric transplants, of which 12 were male children, of which uh, five had postureteral valves uh, ablated, and three of them had reflux nephropathy, two of which had undergone a nephrectomy, and one had a previous ureteric re-implant. Now, we had operated four children uh, weighing less than 15 kgs. The least was about 11 kgs. Uh, 12 children were already initiated on dialysis, three of them peritoneal and nine on hemodialysis, two were preemptive. Live related transplants were performed in 13 uh, patients with cadaveric donor in one patient. Extra we required intraperitoneal approach only in one patient. Perinephric hematoma was a, a complications. The perinephric hematoma was observed in one patient, managed conservatively. Post-op hypotension requiring prolonged inotrope and ventilatory support in one patient, but eventually the graft regained function. Acute rejection we saw in one patient due to non-compliance. Chronic rejection we saw in two patients, one at three years and one at four years. Uh, the three-year one was a cadaveric transplant. We lost one of our patient at two years follow-up to varicella zoster infection. This is a line graph showing our graft survival at five years follow-up, uh, which is about 74%. And a scatter plot showing serum creatinine pre and post operatively, showing favorable outcomes in transplant patients. Now, coming to other challenges which are more important, uh, these include health infrastructure and accessibility, awareness and education, home environment, mental health of the patient and the family, socioeconomic status. All these have to be tackled for most optimal outcomes. To conclude, Comprehensive preoperative urological evaluation of these children with the end stage renal disease is very important. Diligent peritransplant monitoring of the hemodynamic status and also the graft function and on regular follow up is uh, essential. Most optimal outcomes are achieved in pediatric transplants through a multidisciplinary team approach. Thank you. Thank you, Kasi, for uh, this uh, presentation. And with that, uh, we have a uh... Uh, some time for discussion and uh, you can raise your thumb. Uh, Neil, uh, can I? Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. Malik, yeah. I think uh, you yeah. have a mess of questions you have. Yeah, I do have a, a question to Kashi, actually. Yes, sir. The pediatric transplant is a total uh, different ball game. You have yes. an adult kidney getting into a child. So what I would like to look at is leaving the... Uh, there are two aspects, two parts which I would like to ask. One is, how do you manage intraop hemodynamics? Because if that that's a very important aspect of it, you don't manage that, you probably can uh, the child can crash. That's number one. The number two, would I would also like to know what are your outcomes in those patients who are on clean intermittent catheterization with bladder dysfunctions, either they are whether they are PUV or a neurogenic bladder. Because if you are looking at something like a bilateral cystic disease or any other thing, the outcomes are fairly okay. But these patients, how are you looking at managing them and what are their outcomes? If there's anything else specifically, please let us know. Dr. Chawla, yes. you can take these questions. Dr. Chawla, unmute yourself. 
first point regarding uh, the uh, intraoperative management. I think the intraoperative management remains same as that of an adult. It is basically the setting up the lines, which includes the central line, you have a arterial line, you have the two venous lines, uh, as well as you have a clean uh, monitoring of all the uh, 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 parameters uh, during the But the main thing is uh, the balance between under uh, hydrating the patient so that you have a hypotension and the balance between over hydrating so that you get a bulk edema. All this has to be matched with the parameters on table. You need to have a CAP in adult, we keep around 20, in, in children, we keep around uh, uh, 12, uh, 15. And uh, the other thing is uh, the NSC always keep a track on the blood pressure. It might I'm I'm trust support they they keep the line ready in case there is a little bit crash. They keep it just to set up to keep the pressure high, not to have a persistent hypertension. Coming to the second question, luckily in our fourteen patient we didn't have any patient who needed a, a CST because if you see the group of patient we had, we had none of the patient who had a neurogenic blood. No patient had a neurogenic LUTD. All the patients are basically penetral only and few were having a glomerulopathies. So uh, that was a little, uh, what you can say, uh, about last that we didn't have any patient who needed a cat uh, No, my only question in TROP was mo not the monitoring because the big problem is when you actually release the clamps. Because the amount yes, of fluid, yes. which the, no, the amount that, that of blood which goes into the kidney exactly. is huge. Exactly. Uh, exactly. In a 10 15 in a kg old child. So uh, that's a very, very tricky and a very uh, fine management which, which which has to be done at that point of actually, time. And actually, uh, uh, there's one patient which Kasi mentioned. That is an example where we had a large size kidney and we had a hypotension. And this hypotension was refractory a little. We need to uh, keep this patient in ICU and we, we couldn't extubate the patient. But luckily, after three or four hours, only inotrope support of the northern end, patient recovered, BP came up, kidney was pouring urine within three to four and extubated Okay. Dr. Ansari, go ahead with your question. Yes. yes. Uh, my question is to Dr. Emilio Group. And this was a inter very interesting series. A very large number of this harsh sprung along with the Krakut. And uh, because the harsh sprung or the megacolon has been found associated to the bladder dysfunction also, all the aspects with Krakut have been studied. So did we study this bladder dysfunction in this uh, megacolon or harsh sprung group? Professor Emilio. Yes. Uh, we do um, sorry, a complete nephrological vocab to every year sprung patients. So we study every patient because they have a high um, Um, they have high um, prevalence of uh, anomalies. And uh, wh what about the anomalies of the blood? We don't uh, usually found many. And um, we do cystoretrography in these cases or MRI to better understand their anatomy. Yeah. Professor Emilio, you can take this question of Dr. Ansari regarding the bladder uh, involvement in your series. Well, if needed, uh, the bladder study, the bladder is, is studied with uh, uh, VCUG or urodynamics. Uh, it depends uh, from case to case. Actually, it's not uh, it's not part of our standard evaluation. Doctor Ansari. Oh yes, uh, because but even there must be some trend that there's some out of this kekut. Uh, uh, some percentage, nearly 10 or 15% of the kids, they must have presented with, with lower injective symptoms. How they were evaluated? But they have been evaluated mainly from the clinical point of view and from the urodynamic point of view. It really depends. So they are evaluated, as, as I said, they are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis and not on a systematic cases. Depends. They are evaluated. These, these patients are followed in a special clinic. And uh, if needed, they are sent to the urological part. Okay. PJ, go ahead with the question. Thank you, Neil. Um, just one question, practical questions to Emilio and, and Yada, and another one for Mohan. Emilio, um, with this knowledge, do you suggest that we 
how do we approach this in a practical way? Um, do you work uh, in parallel with the pediatric surgeons? Uh, are they aware about any history and they call you? How's the practical way of that? And for Moham, um, two questions about the, the robotic case that you present mm -hmm. very, very nicely. One of the issues of the robotic VUR new implantation is that sometimes they get really tight. How do you measure the tightness of the suture in the in the Gregoire tunnel? And the other one is why do you ask a VCUG at four months after surgery? Okay, Thanks fine. First, Emilio. Emilio, you finished the first question of a um, PZ. Can I answer your question? Uh, we got um a pediatric surgery part with uh, in association with the uro urology oh sorry because we got uh, <laughs> double sounded and uh, with the urologists and uh, we do uh, work uh, multidisciplinarily uh, every day so most of our Hirschsprung patients do the nephrourological workup and uh, whoever need uh, are sent to the urologist for the follow up parts Mohan. Yes, so first of all, thank you, Anil, and um, thank you, Christina. Good presentation, USI. So two questions which were really important, uh, PJ. I think how can you avoid the tunnel tightness? And it does take a time to think about, you know, how you can make the tunnel appropriate because if it is too loose, you have persistence reflux. And if you have too tight, there is obstruction. So what I thought about over a period of time is the visual acumen. And the visual acumen is as you tighten the tunnel, if you see the capillary blanching, then I think you should stop it there. The more you tighten it and you stop seeing the capillary blanching, that means you have tightened it. The other trick to do avoid the obstruction is raise the detrusor flaps a little bit better depending on the urethral diameter. So that's how you can avoid it. Second question is about VCUG. Now, I understand it is a little bit too much to do VCUG, but I think it is important to show the radiographic resolution when you are trying to do some new technique, you are evolving a new technique. Otherwise, we won't learn and we will think that we are doing really well and pat on our back ourselves. So for that evidence-based medicine practice and to learn from our mistakes, uh, I've been doing with UG. Now, when to stop it? Probably if we have at par results with open surgery for you know at least 100 cases or so, then I think you know we can say in my hand, I should stop this at this time. Yeah, Dr. Prashanna. Um, this question is to Kasi and uh, Dr. Arun Chawla. Did you all have any difficulty in these uh, cases for closing the abdomen? Uh, Prasanna, can you repeat the question? Uh, did you have any difficulty in closing the abdomen in all these pediatric transplant cases? Uh, you mean because of the size of that? Uh, we didn't yeah. encounter it. And we didn't encounter any difficulty. Why? Because these grafts are not low towards the inguinal ligament. These grafts are a little high where you have got a flexibility of the abdominal wall to cover uh, uh, without any tension or without any problem. Okay. Uh, uh, second sir, question uh, to Dr. Gunditi. Um, sir, how do we avoid the VAS? Because, I mean, it keeps coming all the time uh, when we do this uh, robotic re-implant. Uh, good technical question again. Thank you. So what I try to do is I put an umbilical tape around the ureter first when I identify above the vas deferens and then create a peritoneal window below the vas deferens and pass the umbilical tape below the vas deferens. In that way, the vas deferens is out of your way where you are working. Now, if you don't do that, then it's coming in your way. The second point when the vas comes in your way is when you are really doing deep dissection at urethrovasical junction, you need to be very careful where the vas is opening into the ejaculatory duct there. And at that place, you need to be just taking your time. And that's where I suggest the Y limb of urethrovasical junction dissection so you don't get into the vas deference medially apart from the neurovascular bundle. Yeah. Okay, thank you. A question from the Kalpana. Uh, Dr. Gundeti, sir, 
good presentation. Uh, I took the liberty to say that um, Dr. Gundeti suggests that uh, in order to start doing robotic assisted reimplant, um, you shouldn't do it at the very beginning. So that is that correct, or should I stop saying that in the future? And the second question is, how many cases would you recommend prior to sort of uh, producing consistent results? Ms. Patel, my teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I think, you know, there is a lot of nuances involved in the robotic reimplant because the stakes of complications are very high. And um, I think, you know, it's, you are your own judgmental person in regards to, you know, when can I take the reimplant? And usually my perception is get comfortable with the robot, you know, do the pyeloplasties, uh, do some surgeries where there is not much of a stake when the complications are there. So there is not a fixed number, but you know I will suggest 2025 20, some robotic cases, and then start with a reimplant. Now that we have so much resources to have, get the help from other, uh, we have videos, we have the technique standardized. I think you know little bit experience in the robot, and then you know taking the reimplant will be a good option, but not immediately, just because of the complications are very high. Uh, last question from Dr. Ansari. Unmute yourself, Monsa. sir. Yes, Mohan, sir. <laughs> so I just wonder what are your thoughts about the nerve sparing reimplantation? Because when you go to take the U-stitch, you go in the area of the neural network because you are going more towards the base of the bladder. So if this, this may be good in unilateral, but the situation arises when you are attempting on both the sides. You're going more on the posterior side to take your U stitch to improve your results by 15%. So again, very important uh, thought. And uh, if I was looking at it, you know, how could we avoid the neurovascular bundle and trying to identify the neurovascular bundle, which was not possible uh, in the real life. So looking into the anatomical studies more and more, it says one centimeter above the urethrovocycal junction dorsomedially. So I think, you know, if you take that into consideration, the Y limb will avoid the dissection or the thermal spread. But when you take the U suture, you do have a risk of taking the nerves. Now, I don't know how you can objectively identify it and avoid it, but only thing I can see that the outcomes in regards to the urinary retention are uh, even in bilateral cases is less than 5%. So probably I think the dissection and the thermal injury is prevented and staying close to the ureter during the U suture is avoiding the neurovascular bundle. So that's what I'm speculating, uh, but you know, I see the end effect in the outcomes of urinary retention. So uh, I have one last question for the Louis. Louis, you are there? Louis? I think I probably agree with the long speculations, but why RGP? I have not uh, regretted any kind my decision of not doing RGP and left out the uh, obstructive uh, head anemic segment. Uh, yeah. Hi. Can I speak on behalf of Dr. Louise? Yes. Quick. So we think uh, RBG here does provide additional information it's not we sometimes it's avoidable nowadays with the proscopic but it is really helpful as a as a as a, a preoperative uh, procedure we can do it and it's sometimes it's really helpful we can find more rotation especially in open pyroplasty since we are nowadays a lot of people are doing small incision uh, to do the pyroplasty so if they can if if they can do it preoperatively it does, uh, we, we're not saying it's mandatory, but it's really helpful uh, procedure. It gives a lot a lot of information for the surgeon. It avoids uh, surprises. And uh, unfortunately, we have seen patients, and actually, it does improve the outcome. We uh, re After adapting this protocol in our center in Canada, in McMaster, we have seen significant improvement of our results. Now, like the, our last uh, case, 
uh, we ha there's complete resolution of hydro forces, complete resolution, because we know exactly the and what you are dealing with before going in. And we, we went for a uh, long saturation. Okay. Many centuries, they don't perform long, long saturation, unfortunately. They do so one or two centimeters, and they don't bypass the problem sometimes. Not all, all the cases, but sometimes. Yes. Agree, agree. So the message is that uh, adequate speculations, or you can say the word long speculation is mandatory or necessary to have a uh, good outcome. So we have a last exactly. two speakers, uh, last two speakers from the SGPGA Lucknow. One is master of fellowship program and our secretary of pediatric urology section. And second is Priyank Kiyadav. Uh, he is a master of doing fellowship at the SGPGA as well as sick kids. So let's have a a uh, small uh, talk from the our secretary, I'm a Sansari from SCPJ. He's the head of the urology department and secretary of pediatric urology section. Sir, go ahead. Yeah. Can someone help Dr. Ansari to? Dr. Ansari? It is visible now? Yeah, visible, sir. But yes, you thank you very visible, much. Sir. Yes, thank Dr. you very much, Dr. Anil, because just to quickly uh, wrap up the pediatric logy and its necessity in a country like India. The idea of pediatric logical practice and training program is to provide specialized training for surgeons, enabling them to become proficient in the diagnosis and treatment of disorders of genital intract in neonates, infants, adolescent patients, and to dedicate their service uh, career to the same. The goal of the fellowship program is to provide an outstanding educational experience to fellows, equipping them with the skills and knowledge necessary to become successful pediatric uh, urologist upon graduation. The fellowship program is uh, designed to provide a comprehensive training in clinical research, reconstructive surgery, endurology, laparoscopy, oncology, and finally the pediatric transplantation. As far as the training is concerned, training in pediatric urology is not purely surgical. Most of the time, the residents and the fellow, they basically target learning the surgical skills only and becoming only the surgical technicians. But that is not the objective. Basically, this is a multidisciplinary approach requiring support of pediatricians, endocrinologists, pediatric nephrologists, pediatric anesthetists, and all the entire ground and the supporting staff and the paramedical staffs. So what do we intend to achieve by training or giving fellowship? The ultimate intent for the fellow is to practice their future specialty in an independent, confident, and the competent manner while becoming a leader in the field. And the pediatric and in, in diagnosing and treating pediatric urological disorders. Besides, we have to create a uh, this uh, pediatric uh, urology workforce also at the level of country, the national, state, as well as the district level so that we have the available train power for medical college institutes and as well as for the individual practices. Regarding the scope of uh, this uh, pediatric urology in India, you will be <laughs> delighted to see the current population of India is 1400 million and the childhood population under 18 um, as per the current consensus census is in between 31 to 35 percent that amounts to nearly 431 million such an enormous population of pediatric urological disorders prevalence in general population is has been to the tune of five to six percent if we uh, extrapolate this percentage to this um, 431 million uh, then we find at any given of uh, given time nearly 25 million of the children they might be affected with very very various kinds of urogenital disorders the demand for pediatric urology basically depends on many factors like the national birth rate which is around 17 much higher in many developing countries prevalence of the urogenital disorder in general population which is to the tune of 5 to 6% currently uh, if we say, uh, according to the uh, this uh, census estimate, it should be nearly 25 million 
children having varying uh, various uh, varying kinds of the urogenital disorders or the this uh, other anom renal anomalies and the second point is the demand depends on the disease burden an indian population um, ha having being nearly 431 million if we take examples of common disorders like hypospadia where prevalence is one in uh, 300 livers or undescended testis, which is qu also quite common, which 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 is to the tune of 0.8 percent. So, as per the census as given above, the estimated new congenital genital malformation every year will be around 60,000, with at least 15 per 15,000 of these new cases being of hypospadias. See, always there is a plenty of cases of a uh, variety of genital disorders. As far as the stakeholders are concerned, for pediatric urology in India, we have many. We have pediatric general surgeons, adult urologists, plastic surgeons, pediatric urologists. I did not mention uh, rightly here the general surgeons also, they are also having uh, their partial, uh, some claim for a pediatric urology. And there are currently nearly two dozens of medical institutions which are currently involved in pediatric urological care. And nearly more than 10 centers in the India are currently providing training in the pediatric urology. All the states are basically having uh, training programs except the eastern part uh, that is still little low in its growth. And the uh, fellowship program is being given currently by four or five centers. And uh, Lucknow is the first center that started almost 10 years ago. And we are now in our uh, completion of the first decade of fellowship program. For the National Board of Examination, which basically aims for the equality in both education as well as examination, uh, this is the central uh, executive body to control the uh, level of postgraduate uh, education in India. Uh, yeah. This has also announced uh, a fellowship program in various subspecialty and pediatric urology is also one of them. This is also accredited by the National Medical Council. This is the first time and we have been writing so many times to NMC. This time they have accredited, but this course is to be put on the panel of the NMC, which is still not there, but they have promised to accredit give accreditation to the fellowship program for two years in pediatric urology. As far as the training module is concerned in India, and uh, I, I said there are the many stakeholders. We have two kinds of the uh, training modules like uh, in Europe and Australia where most of the pediatric surgery, they basically uh, uh, translate into the pediatric urology. Contrary to this, uh, in USA, the adult urology, those who have been trained in adult urology, they opt and go for the training for the pediatric urology. Both the groups have their own arguments in favor and against. And... Uh, uh, the pediatric surgery group says that the pediatric, the adult urologists are not exposed to basic principle in pediatric care. Contrary to this, the American model uh, says that the pediatric surgeons are basically are not the trained pediatric uh, surgeons, but basically they are pediatric general surgeons. They have been exposed to the entire uh, system of the children right from uh, head to toe, but uh, they are not being trained exclusively for genital urinary system. Besides, there is a very poor training in endology, laparoscopy, and renal trans transplantation and the relative work also. And uh, who should be trained in pediatric urology? I leave this question to the house. This is a long debated question, but my take on this is clear that all those seriously interested in the subject those who dedicate to pediatric urological care and they are ready to sacrifice their adult urological practice and as well as to sacrifice general pediatric surgical work. They should be minimum crossover. And the picture itself shows if you do this, what may be the fate of this riding. As far as the impact of pediatric urology training or fellowship is concerned, there are a lot of literature which is available. I have taken one, for example, for the PZs, that this is one electronic survey from uh, California, from uh, Davis Children Hospital, this uh, which included 518 residents along with attendee physicians uh, who had uh, 168 pediatric urologists, and they concluded that more than 70% of the residents and uh, nearly 86% of the attendee physicians, they said that pediatric urology fellowship is must to produce positive or the optimum results. 
and there's another study which is from uh, Lucknow itself, where uh, this, these are the hype uh, done study on cases of hyperspedias, distal, mid, and the proximal. Nearly 300 cases. These patients were divided into three groups: group one, 90, 1997 uh, to 2004. Hypospedias repair was done by multiple surgeons. Then between 2005 to 2006, uh, this was the surgery became uh, this um, concluded to primary one surgeon, and this was the learning curve for that. And from 2007 onward, the surgery, this hypospedia surgery was done exclusively by one surgeon. And you can see the difference between the results. Where are we today? There are currently the system of practice and training India has many gaps and deficiencies. There is, we really lack a super specialty approach. Pattern of clinical practice is grossly generalized. There is a lack of infrastructure, proper teaching and training module. Pediatric urology centers are limited as well as the pediatric fellowship centers are too little. And moreover, fellowship positions are only available after completion of MCH in urology or pediatric surgery. By this time, the aspiring candidate has already completed three, three different phases of medical education that consumes approximately 12 years of his uh, prime uh, life. So that leaves a kind of mental fatigue and educational or learning weariness. And secondly, uh, another important question, is pediatric urology a commercially viable in India because the post-fellowship placement is always remain a concern because there are very few corporate as well as the government institutions where the positions for the pediatric logists are currently available. And uh, we know that the single organ practice is extremely difficult in pediatric urology. This has been a uh, monopoly of uh, adult urology, especially in, in cases of andrology and uro-oncology. Many surgeons are exclusively doing the prostate cancer. But I am happy to mention some of the pediatric logists. They are basically doing ex um, extraordinary one in hypospedias and basically they are stucking to it at least to some kind of single organ practice in India. What is the way forward? A shared vision of policymaker and the practitioner. That is the need of the hour. The government and the national scientific bodies to recognize pediatric logy as the national health priority. National Medical Council is to recognize it as a subspecialty and end panel it as the postgraduate teaching course. The creation of more pediatric urology units and division. Now there's the time that we need to identify the potential training centers, the medical college, the institutions where the pediatric logical courses can be started. Creation of more and more pediatric logic units, faculty positions in the medical college likely to address similar job concerns of pediatric logy fellowship training in India. Arrange more and more outreach program on the principle of teach a man to fish, not teach a man to eat fish. General pediatric logy surgical skill and re with repeated visits, international collaboration, fellow and faculty exchange program, World Health Organization or World Health Association. This uh, um, association also provides no guidelines for how best can be accomplished on international collaboration also. Global, there are several programs available for the pediatric urologists interested in global health outreach. One of them is well-established program is IVU MAT, which was founded by 1995 by Dr. Catherine Debris. And the medical team basically volunteers to reach to the developing countries where the this, uh, this surgical expertise are limited. And uh, periodically they go to work on a particular uh, this uh, surgeries to teach them. And uh, there may be many visits to just to uh, uh, further make them uh, uh, worse in these surgical techniques. And uh, common conditions such as hypospedias and uh, similar reconstructive surgeries are providing the advanced training over many years through IVU model. And uh, we have a very good example of International Bladder Extrophy Consortium, and that was founded by uh, Dr. Richard Grady, we paid our tribute uh, uh, to him today, along with Dr. Asim and uh, his team. And uh, this uh, this is successfully running HBA, one of the medical college in Gujarat itself. Yeah.
and to summarize india has a significant burden of child urological disease with relatively few pediatric urological training centers national medical commission is to recognize is as a sub specialty and panel its post grade teaching courses more centers for pediatric urological training fellowship need to be established pg training should be rotated to academic institutions with good pediatric urological work fellows and the pg trainees on their return to home institution to build practice training and research in pediatric urology unfortunately this does not happen most of the time this is a crossover uh, resident and the fellow from the pediatric surgery goes out the, has a lot of crossover to pediatric surgery in spite of uh, teaching and telling them pediatric urology from a little background he does pediatric urology as well as adult urology that is one problem here with us and finally the pediatric urology is an ideal field for global health program as genital disease diseases account for a large proportion of congenital diseases and with this thank you dr anil and i request all the participants to kindly register become a member of pediatric urology section of india yes perfect thank sir you. so i will be sharing that uh, link to all our national and international participants uh, to become member of uh, pediatric urology section of india uh, usi to encourage us uh, to serve these uh, most needy patients uh, and uh, you see brilliant talk by dr ansari uh, on a very difficult topic uh, to explain and you can imagine that the burden and uh, in the us uh, you have a few, 10 or 11 uh, pediatric urologists uh, localized into the one institutions serving almost a couple of lakhs of people, uh, patient population here we have uh, entire states on eastern side of 18 crore population and no dedicated pediatric urology program there right so you can imagine that how much burden we have and how much uh, miles we have to still walk and go for the best possible care of this and this is this kind of a webinar with the help of our international friends and national friends will be helping us to push our program further uh, we Neil, would like to take a, a think, very quick comment from dr mr desai yeah, who is joined sure, from yes. uh, for, on this platform and sir is having a experience of 5 or 6 decades in the field of urology and sir couple of words uh, for doc, on dr ansar is talk regarding the need of uh, uh, a strong pediatric urology program thank you anil um i totally agree with um, uh, ansari because um, He has really given the picture, and it started uh, in 2007 and 8 when uh, I was um, president of the USI, and we yes. wanted to make a pediatric urology as a sub specialty of it. But there was uh, some problems, and uh, we couldn't do it. But now I'm very glad that it is started now, and um, um, uh, you all people are uh, doing. But you know, but but we didn't uh, wait wait for the specialty to develop. we had a stalwart who have specialized in some part of the pediatric surgery and then um, uh, uh, we were doing this and i was involved in this in uh, with asim shukla pramod reddy and douglas canning uh, they were coming to my place to uh, when they came to civil hospital amdabad they came to nadiyad uh, for um, extra fee of the bladder and then we have that time we had operated from patient from Africa, um, Middle East, India, and we used to collect them, and then uh, we do that. One of the th thing I wanted to share is um, in the last year uh, we did two things. One thing in India, in in Nadia, we did um, screening in school children. In thirteen school school, we screened the school children, and we found the congenital anomalies and uh, a few things. But two patients had a kidney failure. They had a, a single kidney. a uh, polycystic kidney one patient and one patient single kidney with um, cystic and both of them we have they are there they are creatinine in his pore so they are not yet uh, ready for a dialysis but immediately after this exam we are going to do a preemptive uh, transplant on that and second thing last thing i would like to say that um, uh, in kutch you know we've been visiting there and there um, with the help of the organization there we screened 15000 children uh, in every specialty and urology also and then and then we found um, the um, the undescended testes and extrophy and um, and we have been calling them to nadia then uh, getting them treated i think pediatric urology 
has to be a, a, a separate um, a speciality. Then we must have the dedicated people because um, we have a, a tremendous amount of uh, school children and they are not aware that they need to have a, um, um, uh, awareness uh, to get the children screened for this kind of natural knowledge. And, um, but anyway, um, I'm very happy, Anil, and I congratulate you. You got all the experts from all over the world, and then um, you are addressing this, and this is edu educational. And uh, I'm sorry I could not attend earlier. I was occupied with the other work. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for joining and blessing us uh, with these comments and the programs which you have initiated. And many more of us will be following this kind of a module. Uh, quick comment from Mohan a great friend of uh, Indian uh, pediatricologist. Um, I really condemn what you all doing, you know, really congratulations. So my question is, you know, we have a passion to take care of children, but how can you make it happen? You know, as uh, Dr. Ansari mentioned different ways, but then the passion is not really translated livelihood because of the multiple different of the insurance or you know commercial system works but the one thing is the legislation now why in other countries it has got streamlined is because of the legislation from the government bodies so my question to the society is how can we buy in the government organization to get the legislation that there has to be few criteria who can take care of the children in need and how can we as a group do this and buy in the government for legislation, then we will be much more, you know, passionate and then livelihood is not a question to take care of children. Malik, you wanted to comment and respond to... Oh, I was just looking at when uh, uh, Mahdi sir was there on the uh, screen, I just wanted him to speak. But I think we are trying to push the envelope but I still again come back and say that uh, this is an established speciality in the West. In India, there are too many people fiddling around with this speciality. I think we need to uh, promote the speciality appropriately to the public so that they know how to reach and whom to reach and which would be the biggest service which we can give. I think science is a part of the whole thing which we are doing. And uh, science will continue to evolve, and then we will also will all be a part of the scientific uh, program. But I think our public outreach and the pediatricians' outreach to tell them that this is a very specific speciality, and there are people out there who are passionate in taking care of these children right from their birth till uh, whatever age we survive. So I think that part has to go on. That's, right. that's Malik agree. And uh, for that uh, purpose, we distributed the registration link and the uh, login link to the many pediatricians and a uh, large number, not large number, but good number of pediatricians joined for uh, some of the time of this webinar. And I am absolutely agree. It won't be this, uh, this dream or this work will not be finished till we don't, we do not take uh, pediatricians into the ever fold and the confidence because they are the primary referral to the uh, uh, urologist, pediatric urologist. So with that, uh, uh, Priyanka, you can go ahead with the your concluding uh, some remarks on the presentations as well as whatever you want to share in few minutes. Priyanka, hey, Dr. Adil, let, 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 let Priyanka speak for two minutes. How did perfect. this fellowship help? Yes, perfect. He, he perfect. has been at sick kid for two years. That is what I'm saying, that he's yes. a master of he fellowship. Speak. He should, he should yeah. speak. Yes. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank what you, very you much for this the, What you achieve through the fellowship and how you are contributing now. Yes, I, I think uh, just like in, in 30 seconds, I would uh, like to mention initially that, uh, you know, all mentors have been mentees at some point of time. And throughout their own career, they tend to sort of develop a philosophy that encompasses their understanding of pathophysiology and their relationship with the tissue as a surgeon, which is, you know, as fellows, we used to see how and why uh, they uh, and where they use their instrument on the tissue. So ultimately what happens is the embodiment of this philosophy transforms those mentors into the actual mentors. 
and we try to imbibe that philosophy to further our understanding. Now, uh, having said that, and Dr. Ansari actually covered almost every single point that could be covered, um, I would like to say that uh, the fellowship gives an exposure to actually you know, do a deep dive and see which are the things that you want to see in yourself as a surgeon when you walk down that path. And uh, it is important for, for us to actually see as many people, as many surgeons who have actually done surgeries as possible. Because again, if I'm comfortable, let's say doing a robotic surgery, uh, another person is comfortable doing a reconstructive surgery or an open reconstructive surgery, that is a personal choice. Now, uh, we've had this discussion about why the specialty needs to be developed and there's demand and there is less supply and there should be you know, a uh, combined effort, legislation and everything combined. But there's one thing that is absent from almost every time we uh, have such discussion. And that is we, we actually need to talk to the residents and people who are going to take this to the next level. What is the fear in their mind to dedicate themselves into this specialty? If it's not lucrative, why it is not lucrative? So when we do things like uh, QI improvement pro uh, projects, we have this concept of five whys. So just keep on asking why, why, why five times. And that will lead you to, to an answer why, uh, like how to uh, make an improvement or, uh, or a difference. So for example, if we ask why pediatric urology subsection of the USI does not have maybe as many numbers as the urology section, for example. So the simple reason may be why, because it's it's not as lucrative as a career option to dedicate yourself. Why is that not an option? Because there's too much competition. Now, we are very far from the point when the government will be inclined to dedicate uh, pediatric urologists the forum that they deserve because of the numbers we are dealing with. So for the next so many years, there will not be any good support from the government to dedicate this exclusive specialty to a group of people who, are, who we know as pediatric urologists. So how can we actually discuss and make a proposal and make them understand that this is the way forward? It might be a median path from our end. We can say, yes, this is a specialty that is very, very uh, uh, resource intensive and very, very uh, like skilled uh, thing, which cannot be left to maybe just general surgeons. But again, we somehow have to have those discussions in the USA, and I think it is the right time when we have many people who are actually motivated, but they're scared to take that path because, again, they want to uh, see themselves earn as much as their peers do. International fellowships help because, again, you get to see uh, what happens across the world, how people are, you know, for example, in Canada, I could see that if you are a pediatric urologist, then uh, in a particular practicing in a particular region, then you don't have to worry too much about getting a number of patients because again, that being a public funded system, the patient arrival is more or less organized in a manner uh, like we have in public hospitals in India. But again, in a private practice, everything changes totally. So somehow we need to have this discussion, how to bring everyone on board, how to even make a sound referral system. Let us say it's a peer-to-peer -peer referral. Then how do we ask the adult urologists who are doing pyeloplasties on, on patients who are like six years, eight years old, how do we actually stop them or even motivate them, uh, uh, them from you know passing them on to the peers who are taking up pediatric urology as a practice? So it's time we have those discussions and include more residents, especially the final year residents who are going to take up fellowships, who are going to be the next uh, line of people who uh, take that march forward. So I think I would request the like USI to actually uh, initiate those discussions. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes, that would be all. Fine. Thank you so much. Thank you Prem, Anil. for that uh, extremely excellent uh, words. Uh, very much uh, Anil, Anil, to right. the juniors. Yeah. Before uh, yes. you say. So yeah. we, yes, we have we we should listen, Doctor Asim. He has been watching. Yeah, yeah. that is what I'm saying. Yes, before yes. to before he you has say, been watching us for last uh, you, three decades. Before, before he should, you he say will thanks. give a neutral comment, and then Perfect. followed by Doctor Kalpana also. Yes. No, before you say thanks to the our international yes. guest as well as yes. national uh, attendees, uh, let yes. the our uh, international friends like Asim and Kalpana to give some feedback. Uh, Asim, yes. you first tell us something. Oh. Oh, thank you, Dr. Ansari. It's very kind of you. You know, it's uh, 
it's been really a privilege uh, to see the growth of pediatric urology over 17 years, it, uh, actually longer. You know, my first trip to India was in 2002 as a pediatric urology fellow uh, with Pat Cartwright and uh, uh, Doug Copeland. And we came to CMC Vellore uh, and Dr. Sudipta Gupta was there. Dr. Ganesh was there. Uh, we did an extra fee camp. And that really, you know, gave me a, a, the first insight into urology, pediatric urology. Of course, it was dominated at that time um, by pediatric surgery, and we worked well with them. Then it was 2008, uh, as Dr. Uh, Desai mentioned, that we had a little uh, confabulation in Goa, a beautiful meeting that brought pediatric surgeons and pediatric urologists of India together, urologists and pediatric surgeons together. A first attempt to really start that conversation that we're going to do this and we're going to do this together. Uh, and, and then we've seen the growth, and it has been phenomenal. And what has been really interesting in the organic growth of this, um, yes, uh, you know, on some points, you know, you would think that by now we would have more pediatric urologists who are 100%, you know, like what we're seeing in Lucknow, uh, like we're seeing, you know, attempts being made elsewhere. But it has taken a little longer than I expected. But what I have seen is the academic content the commitment that has really grown. Um, I, you know, I see it in the, you know, when I started as a resident in 1995 here in the U.S., uh, you know, it was already established because the John Duckett's and the, uh, uh, you know, Hardy Hendren, who was a pediatric surgeon, but John Duckett, who was a urologist, who then did a pediatric urology fellowship, had already started to establish that we are going to make a separate specialty. And this is how it's done. They started having their meetings. First, they split away and they had them only with the pediatricians. And then they came back and then they united again at the AUA. And we've seen our ups and downs and that is expected. But the key is what Dr. Canning always said. You know, if you start with the child, what is the best thing for that child? Who brings the best care? And I honestly believe that urologists, those of us trained in urology, have a very important role to play. Our understanding of bladder physiology, our understanding of endourology, use of, uh, of uh, uh, endoscopes and, and catheters, and, and, and the use of uh, um, and the understanding of renal physiology. It really is a step above that you can offer these children. And until we do that, and we mean it, and I, I have heard Dr. Desai, and I know he means it, that, you know, he'll take a pediatric urologist, pay them the same amount he'll pay an adult urologist. You know, Dr. Subnis will agree to that. You know, um, and as, as more and more institutes do that, it really is, I think, the, a, a game changer. And I hope that more of these meetings, you know, seeing so many people joining this meeting will ensure that the specialty will grow. And we in the diaspora are here as your partners always. Um, and we consider it a great honor to be able to continue in the way you work with us so easily uh, and, and in such a mutually respectful way. I think we are good road ahead. Thank you, Asim. Thank you very much for those nice words. Kalpana? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ansari, or Professor Ansari, for asking me to speak. And thank you, Anil, for giving me the opportunity. What can I say? I come from a country with about 70 million population. India is a country of 1.2 billion, if I got it right. So the any problem is so magnified over there. Having said that, again, I won't tell you what happens in UK in training because I don't think that is completely relevant because UK training in pediatric urology was the first in the world in Great Ormond Street Hospital more than 170 years ago. But coming back to the practicalities, as um, Dr. Ansari said, I think we have to start somewhere, isn't it? Unless you make the start, you're not going to progress. And what I see from a distance and from 30 year old experience and very uh, remote experiences now, to my mind, what the two main things which uh, I think might pose a limiting factor, and as Dr. Ansari alluded to, one uh, is settling in life. I mean, 
you take so long to do your graduation, post-graduation, your fellowship, and then post-fellowship, if you ask for more training, that's where the problem arises. So my um, suggestion would be somewhere along the line in training, let the trainees express their interest, let them do the fellowship within their training. I'm going back on my words in UK, um, in the training program, the trainee is allowed to express specialism interest in the last two years. And the trainee is placed in a center towards the end of the training in the area of interest and specialism. After that, the trainee is allowed to specialize further depending on their need, individual need. Like for me, I came to UK having trained elsewhere, but I knew I wanted to do pediatric urology. So I did my fellowship in pediatric general surgery, pediatric surgery. I did a fellowship in GOS for three years because I wanted to come out at the other end and do only pediatric urology. So here in UK, the trainees express interest early on. Perhaps you can think about that. The second thing is about uh, settling in life earning to support yourself and your family and the extended family. That's a practical, important and difficult thing to resolve. It's equally important as training, but that I wouldn't be able to advise because you all will know it better how to sort of approach. But I do know that that also can be addressed by making everyone aware. What do the specialist pediatric urologists have got to offer, which the others don't offer. And there again, training and regulation and certification comes in. So the road is not um, a straight level ground. It's a steep hill. But you'll have started in India, you'll have started the process. So you're bound to reach it. May not be 170 years, but much earlier. Thank you, Kalpana. Uh... Any international uh, expert want to make? I, I would like to make two to three statements. Sir. Sir, quick call. Yeah, yeah. I think the I'm very happy that every aspect is starting from training to expand it. So I would like to make some practical points, and especially those who are in the training centers, like uh, Dr. Ansari is sitting, that in all urology department, at least one unit has to be assigned to a pediatric urology, number one. Number two, all trainees, as uh, Priyank has pointed out, that how to in, um, uh, make them interested in that one. So that we they don't have exposure, actually, the pediatric urology, unless they have exposure, how they will be interested. So there should be a referral program as we started for the renal transplant. Similarly, the all uh, MCH training or DNB trainees, they should be sent to the pediatric urology training centers for three months or six months during their MCH or DNB training program. So that will be another one. Third one is that as soon as they come back, then start with one unit in the uh, medical colleges, at least that, that goes with the pediatric urology. And along with that, we'll have to work with the government also, as you know, Professor Ansari has pointed out very nicely at bo both at the national board as well as NMC. Thank you. I am very happy that every aspect in this webinar has been discussed, starting from the uh, uh, training to the high-level academic discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think Professor Eman Pathak is there. He is a teacher at PAR in field of pediatric urology. Sir, if you are there, uh, you can make a quick comment. Professor Raman Pathak, he could not join initially, but I think uh, I saw him. If he's not there, uh, then uh, uh, I think I request uh, quickly uh, Dr. Sujata Patwardhan to express our thank uh, on behalf of Indian School of Urology. Sujata, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anil. And yeah, definitely it was uh, a long session, but very useful. And I'm happy that all the students and their mentors participated. You definitely have a very good group uh, who is supporting pediatric urology. And uh, uh, the same applies to quite a few subspecialities in India that 
our students do not have fellowship programs there is no hand holding there is no mentor and i think uh, we should work towards it by the help of your uh, your friends and our contacts all over the globe and we have so many people out there to help us and have that attitude to uh, see us progress <laughs> and uh, achieve levels which are equivalent to the world standards and i think the it would be soon possible so thank you very much once more for arranging and taking all these efforts all credit goes to you and thank you to the pediatric section of uh, subsection of urology and uh, to usi and all our uh, delegates and all the speakers thank you very much and good night thank you dr sujata for those nice comments uh... it is always collective efforts and uh, why it is resident mentors we wanted to give residents or junior or fellow or junior consultant to give up this opportunity to speak in front of such a uh, large number of experts and a big platform and this is working i get a feedback uh, always from the residents and fellow that they are really enjoying this uh, sort of uh, program and they get a lot of push uh, to think about pediatric urology when they participate in this kind of a meeting so with that uh, i'm expressing my thanks uh, for giving your complete support to us uh, when we contact you through the mail or whatsapp immediately i got started getting the registration of the team and we could make this program uh, quite uh, uh, inclusive of almost everything regarding the pediatric urology in uh, every uh, right from the basics to the advanced as well as the coaching and the fellowship and all those things so thank you very much to all of you and now i'm handing over for the last comment to our secretary pediatric urology section dr ansari to express our thanks dr ansari unmute yourself oh yes, oh, yes. thank you so much dr ansari you had been a master of ceremonies and uh, sir and, uh, audio sir audio please Oh, yes, I, I I always say that uh, you are the most dynamic person in the PUS these days, and uh, you always remain a source of uh, energy as well as inspiration for all of us. So all congratulations to you. Of course, the team of USI who basically incorporated the ISU as well as and the PA and the PUS and uh, Professor Bart who has been guiding all of us. Thank you very much for all the international faculty who has given their time. which could have been little odd for them but they joined us to make it more conclusive yes and inclusive and, for this yes thank you so and much and dr ansari i have a one small comment that we all realize that globe need to come closer to show this most needed community or fragile community and for that i will i i will try and propose a global foundation pediatric urology global foundation sort of thing a international society where there is no borders like uh, pus and uh, then the spu and the espu and this and that so let us have let us try for that a global society a global foundation which works for these children any anywhere across the world nay do you know dr um, anil there is a doctors beyond borders yeah central yeah. there is a organization yes doctors yeah. beyond uh, so similarly borders. in the same line we yes. will try to work uh, yeah. not on the global webinar but the global yes. foundation pediatric urology foundation no, no, this will be pediatric the... yes pediatric urologist beyond borders yes yeah. and we need support of asim kalpana and many more other friends pj ebilios from all over the world those who are participating very actively and pushing us to serve yes. this community much better way so yes. thank you once again uh, any further comment from secretary then otherwise we close this webinar i am always there to to contribute whenever and wherever okay thank yeah, you so thank much. you thank you we'll start working on on that direction very soon uh sir secretary sir said we declare this webinar close yes please go so thank we you we thank you everyone conclusion yes yeah okay. long long right. session thank you very much and i apologize for such and glitches we try yesterday to give a trial run but uh, still there were a couple of glitches yes malik Yes, bro. Nothing, nothing. Oh, I, I don't know why. Just because I, uh, I lifted my hand, it started uh, showing. <laughs> I, uh, there, is, there is nothing. Uh, I don't know. I, I should AI. probably AI Zoom Zoom AI. <laughs> Zoom no. AI. Yes, absolutely. No, uh, Anil. <laughs> another glitch to take care of. Otherwise, 
keep on putting his hand. Anything at all. <laughs> anyway, good night. Bye, everyone. I see, good night, yeah. see you at Naples, probably. I think you're all there. I think yes, def definitely. See you at Naples so we, soon. We are reaching on 16th evening, so we can think of catching up. 16th evening. All right, we'll get a pizza together. Okay. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, like, pizza Napolitana. All right. Bye. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good yeah, night. Sure. Good night. Yeah. Thank you once again. Thank you and good night. Thank you.